Chapter Ten of the Invasion by William Lequeux. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Ten. British abandoned Colchester. On Tuesday, tenth September, the Daily News published the following telegram from its war correspondent, Mister Edgar Hamilton, Chelmsford, Monday, September nine. I sit down after a sleepless night to indict the account of our latest move. We hear that Sheffield has fallen and our troops are in flight. As by the time this appears in print, the enemy will of necessity be aware of our abandonment of Colchester, the censor will not, I imagine, prevent the dispatch of my letter. For our move has been made one of a retrograde nature and I do not doubt that the cavalry of the German Ninth Corps are close behind us and in touch with our own. But I must not, in using the word retrograde, be supposed to criticize in any way the strategy of our generals. For everyone here is, I am sure, fully persuaded of the wisdom of the step. Colchester, with its plucky little garrison, was altogether too much in the air and stood a great risk of being isolated by a converging advance of the Ninth and Tenth Corps of the German invaders, to say nothing of the Twelfth Saxon Corps at Malden, which, since the unfortunate Battle of Purley, has shown itself very active to the north and east. The Saxons have refrained from attacking our Fifth Corps since its repulse, and it has been left almost in peace to entrench its position from Danbury to the southward. But, on the other hand, while not neglecting to further strengthen their already formidable defences between the Blackwater and the Crouch, their cavalry have scoured the country up to the very gates of Colchester. Yesterday morning the 16th Lancers and the 17th Hussars, who had fallen back from Norwich, together with some of the local yeomanry, moved out by the Tolshunt Darcy and Great Totham Roads, and drove in their patrols with some loss. At Tiptree Heath there was a sharp cavalry engagement between our Red Lancers and several squadrons of a sky-blue Hussar regiment. Our people routed them, but in the pursuit that followed would have fared badly, as they fell in with the four remaining squadrons supported by another complete regiment, had it not been for the opportune arrival of the Household Cavalry Brigade, which had moved northeast from Danbury to cooperate. This completely changed the aspect of affairs. The Germans were soundly beaten, with the loss of a large number of prisoners, and galloped back to Malden in confusion. In the meantime, the Second King's own Royal Lancaster Regiment and the Fifth Battery RF Artillery had been sent down to Witham by train, whence they marched up to the high ground near Wickham Bishops. They and the yeomanry were left there in a position to cover the main London road, and the great eastern railway, and at the same time threaten any movement of the enemy by the great Totham Road. When the news of our success reached Colchester, soon after midday, we were all very jubilant. In fact, I fear that a great many people spent the afternoon in a species of fool's paradise, and when towards the evening the announcement of our splendid victory at Royston was posted up on the red walls of the fine town hall, and outside the cuffs there was an incipient outbreak of that un-English excitement known as mafficking. But this exultation was fated to be but short-lived, even though the mayor appeared on the balcony of the town hall and addressed the crowd, while the latest news was posted outside the offices of the Essex Telegraph opposite the post office. The wind was in the north, and about 5.45 in the afternoon, the sound of a heavy explosion was heard from the direction of Manningtree. I was in the Cups Hotel at the time arranging for an early dinner, and ran out into the street. As I emerged from the archway of the hotel I distinctly heard a second detonation from the same direction. A sudden silence, ominous and unnatural, seemed to fall on the yelping jingoes in the street, in the midst of which the rumble of yet another explosion rolled down on the wind this time from a more westerly direction. Men asked their neighbors breathlessly as to what all this portended. I myself knew no more than the most ignorant of the crowd, till in an officer who had rushed hastily by me in Head Street on his way into the hotel, I recognized my friend Captain Burton, 
of the artillery. I buttonholed him at once. "'Do I know what those explosions were?' repeated he in answer to my inquiry. "'Well, I don't know, but I'm open to bet you're five to one that it's the sappers blowing up the bridges over the Star at Manning Tree and Stratford St. Mary. Then the Germans will have arrived there?' I inquired. "'Most probably. And look here,' he continued, taking me aside by the arm and lowering his voice. "'You take my tip. We shall be out of this to-night. So you'd best pack up your traps and get into marching order.' "'Do you know this?' said I. "'Not officially, or I shouldn't tell you anything about it. But I can put two and two together. We all know that the general wouldn't be fool enough to try and defend an open town of this size with such a small garrison against a whole army corps, or perhaps more. It would serve no good purpose, and expose the place to destruction, and bring all sorts of disaster on the civil population. You could have seen that for yourself, for no attempt whatever has been made to erect defenses of any kind, neither have we received any reinforcements at all. If they had meant to defend it, they could certainly have contrived to send us some volunteers and guns at any rate. No, the few troops we have here have done their best in assisting the Danbury force against the Saxons, and are much too valuable to be left here to be cut off without being able to do much to check the advance of the enemy. If we had been going to try anything of that kind, we should have now been holding the line of the River Star, but I know we have only small detachments at the various bridges, sufficient only to drive off the enemy's cavalry patrols. By now, having blown up the bridges, I expect they are falling back as fast as they can. Besides, look here, he added, what do you think that battalion was sent to Wickham Bishops for this morning? I told him my theories, as set forth above. Oh, yes, that's all right, he answered but you may bet your boots that there's more in it than that. In my opinion, the general has had orders to clear out as soon as the enemy are preparing to cross the Star, and the Lancasters are planted there to protect our left flank from an attack from Malden while we are retreating on Chelmsford. But we might fall back on Braintree, I hazarded. Don't you believe it? We're not wanted there, at least, I mean, not so much as elsewhere." where we shall come in is to help fill the gap between Braintree and Danbury. I think, myself, we might just as well have done it before. We have been sending back stores by rail for the last two days. Well, good-bye, he said, holding out his hand. Keep all this to yourself, and mark my words, we'll be off at dusk. Away he went, and convinced that his prognostications were correct, as indeed in the main they proved, I hastened to eat my dinner, pay my bill, and get my portmanteau packed and stowed away in my motor. As soon as the evening began to close in, I started and made for the barracks, going easy. The streets were still full of people, but they were very quiet, and mostly talking together in scattered groups. A shadow seemed to have fallen on the jubilant crowd of the afternoon, though as far as I could ascertain, there were no definite rumors of the departure of the troops and the close advent of the enemy. When I arrived at the barracks I saw at once that there was something in the wind, and pulled up alongside the barracks railings, determined to watch the progress of events. I had not long to wait. In about ten minutes a bugle sounded, and a scattered assemblage of men on the barracks square closed together and solidified into a series of quarter columns. At the same time the volunteer battalion moved across from the other side of the road and joined the regular troops. I heard a sharp clatter and jingling behind me, and, looking round, saw the general and his staff with a squad of cavalry canter up the road. They turned into the barrack gate, greeted by a sharp word of command and the rattle of arms from the assembled battalions. As far as I could make out, the general made them some kind of address, after which I heard another word of command, upon which the regiment nearest to the gate formed fours and marched out. It was the second Dorsetshire. I watched anxiously to see which way they turned. As I more than expected, they turned in the direction of the London Road. My friend had been right so far, but till the troops arrived at Mark's Tay, where the road forked, I could not be certain whether they were going towards Braintree or Chelmsford. The volunteers followed, then the Leicestershires, then a long train of artillery, field batteries, big four-seven guns and howitzers. 
the king's own Scottish borderers formed the rear guard. With them marched the general and his staff. I saw no cavalry. I discovered afterwards that the general, foreseeing that a retirement was imminent, had ordered the 16th Lancers and the 7th Hussars, after their successful morning performance, to remain till further orders at Kelvedon and Tiptree respectively, so that their horses were resting during the afternoon. During the night march the former came back and formed a screen behind the retiring column, while the latter were in a position to observe and check any movement northwards that might be made by the Saxons, at the same time protecting its flank and rear from a possible advance by the cavalry of von Kronhelm's army, should they succeed in crossing the river Star soon enough to be able to press after us in pursuit by either of the two eastern roads leading from Colchester to Malden. After the last of the departing soldiers had tramped away into the gathering darkness through the mud, which, after yesterday's downpour, still lay thick upon the roads, I bethought me that I might as well run down to the railway station to see if anything was going on there. I was just in time. The electric light disclosed a bustling scene as the last of the ammunition, and a certain proportion of stores were being hurried into a long train that stood with steam up, ready to be off. The police allowed none of the general public to enter the station, but my correspondence pass obtained me admission to the departure platform. There I saw several detachments of the Royal Engineers, the mounted infantry, minus their horses, which had already been sent on, and some of the Leicestershire Regiment. Many of the men had their arms, legs, or heads bandaged, and bore evident traces of having been in action. I got into conversation with a color sergeant of the engineers, and learned these were the detachments who had been stationed at the bridges over the Star. It appears there was some sharp skirmishing with the German advance troops before the officers in command had decided that they were in sufficient force to justify them in blowing up the bridges. In fact, at the one of which my informant was stationed, and that the most important one of all, over which the main road from Ipswich passed at Stratford St. Mary, the officer in charge delayed just too long, so that a party of the enemy's cavalry actually secured the bridge, and succeeded in cutting the wires leading to the charges which had been placed in readiness to blow it up. Luckily the various detachments present rose like one man to the occasion, and, despite a heavy fire, hurled themselves upon the intruders with the bayonet with such determination and impetus that the bridge was swept clear in a moment. The wires were reconnected, and the bridge cleared of our men just as the Germans, reinforced by several of their supporting squadrons, who had come up at a gallop, dashed upon it in pursuit. The firing key was pressed at this critical moment, and, with a stunning report, a whole troop was blown into the air, the remaining horses mad with fright stampeding despite all that their riders could do. The road was cut, and the German advance temporarily checked, while the British detachment made off as fast as it could for Colchester. I asked the sergeant how long he thought it would be before the Germans succeeded in crossing it. "'Bless you, sir. I expect they're over by now,' he answered. They would be sure to have their bridging companies somewhere close up, and it would not take more than an hour or two to throw a bridge over that place." The bridges at Boxted Mill and Nayland had been destroyed previously. The railway bridge and the other one at Manningtree were blown up before the Germans could get a footing, and their defenders had come in by rail. But my conversation was cut short, the whistle sounded, the men were hustled on board the train, and it moved slowly out of the station. As for me, I hurried out to my car, and, putting on speed, was soon clear of the town and spinning along for Mark's Tay. It is about five miles, and shortly before I got there I overtook the marching column. The men were halted and in the act of putting on their greatcoats. I was stopped there by the rear guard who took charge of me and would not let me proceed until permission was obtained from the general. Eventually this officer ordered me to be brought to him. I presented my pass, but he said, I am afraid that I shall have to ask you either to turn back or to slow down and keep pace with us. In fact, you had better do the latter. I might indeed have to exercise my powers and impress your motor should the exigencies of the service require it. I saw that it was best to make virtue of necessity 
and replied that it was very much at his service and I was very well content to accompany the column. In point of fact, the latter was strictly true, for I wanted to see what was to be seen, and there were no points about going along with no definite idea of where I wanted to get to, with the possible chance of falling into the hands of the Saxons, into the bargain. So a staff officer, who was suffering from a slight wound, was placed alongside me, and the column, having muffled itself in its greatcoats, once more began to plug along through the thickening mire. My position was just in front of the guns, which kept up a monotonous rumble behind me. My companion was talkative and afforded me a good deal of incidental and welcome information. Thus, just after we started, and were turning to the left at Mark's Tay, a bright glare followed by a loudish report came from the right of the road. "'What's that?' I naturally ejaculated. "'Oh, that will be the sappers destroying the junction with the Sudbury line,' he replied. "'There's a train waiting for them just beyond.' So it was. The train that I had seen leaving had evidently stopped after passing the junction while the line was broken behind it. They will do the same after passing the cross line at Widham, volunteered he. A mile or two further on we passed between two lines of horsemen, their faces set northwards and muffled to the eyes in their long cloaks. That's some of the sixteenth, he said, going to cover our rear. So we moved on all night through the darkness and rain, and with the first glimmer of dawn halted at Widham. We had about nine miles still to go to reach Chelmsford, which I learned was our immediate destination, and it was decided to rest here for an hour while the men made the best breakfast they could from the contents of their haversacks. But the villagers brought out hot tea and coffee, and did the best they could for us, so we did not fare so badly after all. As for me, I got permission to go on, taking with me my friend the staff officer who had dispatches to forward from Chelmsford. I pushed on at full speed. We were there in a very short space of time, and during the morning I learned that the Braintree Army was falling back on Dunmow, and that Colchester Garrison was to assist in holding the line of the River Chelmer. Notice. Concerning Wounded British Soldiers. In compliance with an order of the Commander-in-Chief of the German Imperial Army, the Governor-General of East Anglia decrees as follows. 1. Every inhabitant of the counties of Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex, Cambridge, Lincolnshire, Yorkshire, Nottingham, Derby, Leicester, Northampton, Rutland, Huntington, and Hertford, who gives asylum to, or lodges one or more ill or wounded British soldiers, is obliged to make a declaration to the mayor of the town or to the local police within twenty-four hours, stating name, grade, place of birth, and nature of illness or injury. Every change of domicile of the wounded is also to be notified within twenty-four hours. In absence of masters, servants are ordered to make the necessary declarations. The same order applies to the directors of hospitals, surgeries, or ambulance stations who receive the British wounded within our jurisdiction. 2. All mayors are ordered to prepare lists of the British wounded, showing the number with their names, grade, and place of birth in each district. 3. The mayor or the superintendent of police must send on the first and fifteenth of each month a copy of his list to the headquarters of the commander-in-chief. The first list must be sent on the fifteenth September. 4. Any person failing to comply with this order will, in addition to being placed under arrest for harboring British troops, be fined a sum not exceeding twenty pounds. 5. This decree is to be published in all towns and villages in the province of East Anglia. Count von Schoenberg Waldenberg, Lieutenant General, Governor of German East Anglia, Ipswich, September 6, 1910. End of chapter 10. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapter Eleven of the Invasion by William Lequeu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Eleven. Fierce Fighting at Chelmsford. A dispatch from Mister Edgar Hamilton to the Daily News as follows was published on Saturday, fifteenth September. 
at Little Waltham I found myself close to the scene of action. About a mile ahead of me the hamlet of Howe Street was in flames and burning furiously. I could see the shells bursting in and all over it in perfect coveys. I could not make out where they were coming from, but an officer I met said he thought the enemy must have several batteries in action on the high ground about Litley Green, a mile and a half to the north on the opposite side of the river. I crossed over myself and got up on the knoll where the Leicestershires and Dorsets had been stationed, together with a number of the four seven-inch guns brought from Colchester. This piece of elevated ground is about two miles long, running almost north and south, and at the top of it I got an extensive view to the eastward right away to beyond Whittam as the ground fell all the way. The country was well wooded, and a perfect maze of trees and hedgerows. If there were any Germans down there in this plain they were lying very low indeed, for my glasses did not discover the least indication of their presence. Due east my view was bounded by the high wooded ground about Wickham Bishops and Tiptree Heath which lay a long blue hummock on the horizon, while to the southeast Danbury Hill, with our big war balloon floating overhead, was plainly discernible. While I gazed on the apparently peaceful landscape I was startled by a nasty sharp hissing sound which came momentarily nearer. It seemed to pass over my head and was followed by a loud bang in the air where now hung a ring of white smoke. It was a shell from the enemy. Just ahead of me was a somewhat extensive wood, and, urged by some insane impulse of seeking shelter, I left the car, which I ordered my chauffeur to take back for a mile and wait, and made for the close-standing trees. If I had stopped to think I should have realized that the wood gave me actually no protection whatever, and I had not gone far when the crashing of timber and noise of the bursting projectiles overhead and in the undergrowth around made me understand clearly that the Germans were making a special target of the wood which I imagined they thought might conceal some of our troops. I wished heartily that I was seated beside my chauffeur in his fast receding car. However, my first object was to get clear of the wood again, and after some little time I emerged on the west side right in the middle of a dressing station for the wounded which had been established in a little hollow. Two surgeons with their assistants were already busily engaged with a number of wounded men, most of whom were badly hit by shrapnel bullets about the upper part of the body. I gathered from one or two of the few most slightly wounded men that our people had been and were very hardly put to it to hold their own. I reckon, said one of them, a bombardier of artillery, that the enemy must have got more than a hundred guns firing at us and at Howe Street Village. If we could only make out where the foreign devils were, continued my informant, our chaps could have knocked a good many of them out with our four-point-sevens, especially if we could have got a go at them before they got within range themselves. But they must have somehow contrived to get them into position during the night, for we saw nothing of them coming up. They are somewhere about Chatley, Fairstead Lodge, and Little Lays, but as we can't locate them exactly, and only have ten guns up here, it don't give us much chance, does it? Later I saw an officer of the Dorsets who confirmed the gunner's story, but added that our people were well entrenched and the guns well concealed, so that none of the latter had been put out of action, and he thought we should be able to hold on to the hill all right. I regained my car without further adventure, bar several narrow escapes from stray shell, and made my way back as quickly as possible to Chelmsford. The firing went on all day, not only to the northward, but also away to the southward, where the Saxons, while not making any determined attack, kept the Fifth Corps continually on the alert, and there was an almost continuous duel between the heavy pieces. As it appeared certain that the knoll I had visited in the forenoon was the main objective of the enemy's attack, reinforcements had been more than once sent up there, but the German shell-fire was so heavy that they found it almost impossible to construct the additional cover required. Several batteries of artillery were dispatched to Pleshy and Rolfe Green to keep down, if possible, the fire of the Germans, but it seemed to increase rather than diminish they must have had more guns in action than they had at first. Just at dusk their infantry had made the first openly offensive movement. 
several lines of skirmishers suddenly appeared in the valley between Little Lays and Chatley, and advanced towards Lionshaw Wood at the north end of the knoll east of Little Waltham. They were at first invisible from the British gun positions on the other side of Chelmer, and when they cleared the spur on which Hyde Hall stands they were hardly discernible in the gathering darkness. The Dorsetshire and the other battalions garrisoning the knoll manned their breastworks as they got within rifle range and opened fire, but they were still subjected to the infernal rafale from the Hanoverian guns on the hills to the northward, and to make matters worse at this critical moment the Tenth Corps brought a long line of guns into action between Flax Green and Great Lays Wood, in which position none of the British guns, except a few on the knoll itself, could reach them. Under this cross-hurricane of projectiles the British fire was quite beaten down, and the Germans followed up their skirmishers by almost solid masses which advanced with all but impunity save for the fire of a few British long-range guns at Fleshy Mount. There they were firing almost at random, as the gunners could not be certain of the exact whereabouts of their objectives. There was a searchlight on the knoll, but at the first sweep of its ray it was absolutely demolished by a blizzard of shrapnel. Every German gun was turned upon it. The Hanoverian battalions now swarmed to the assault, disregarding the gaps made in their ranks by the magazine fire of the defenders as soon as their close advance masked the fire of their own cannon. The British fought desperately. Three several times they hurled back the attackers, but alas we were overborne by sheer weight of numbers. Reinforcements summoned by telephone, as soon as the determined nature of the attack was apparent, were hurried up from every available source, but they only arrived in time to be carried down the hill again in the rush of its defeated defenders, and to share with them the storm of projectiles from the quick firers of General von Kronhelm's artillery which had been pushed forward during the assault. It was with the greatest difficulty that the shattered and disorganized troops were got over the river at Little Waltham. As it was, hundreds were drowned in the little stream, and hundreds of others killed and wounded by the fire of the Germans. They had won the first trick. This was indisputable, and as ill news travels apace a feeling of gloom fell upon our whole force, for it was realized that the possession of the captured knoll would enable the enemy to mass troops almost within effective rifle range of our river line of defense. I believe that it was proposed by some officers on the staff that we should wheel back our left and take up a fresh position during the night. This was overruled, as it was recognized that to do so would enable the enemy to push in between the Dunmile force and our own, and so cut our general line in half. All that could be done was to get up every available gun and bombard the hill during the night in order to hamper the enemy in his preparations for further movement and in his entrenching operations. Had we more men at our disposal, I suppose there is little doubt that a strong counterattack would have been made on the knoll almost immediately. But in the face of the enormous numbers opposed to us, I imagine that General Blennerhassett did not feel justified in denuding any portion of our position of its defenders. So all through the dark hours the thunder of the great guns went on. In spite of the cannonade the Germans turned on no less than three searchlights from the southern end of the knoll about midnight. Two were at once put out by our fire, but the third managed to exist for over half an hour and enabled the Germans to see how hard we were working to improve our defenses along the river bank. I am afraid that they were by this means able to make themselves acquainted with the positions of a great number of our trenches. During the night our patrols reported being unable to penetrate beyond Pratt's farm, Mount Maskell, and Porter's farm on the Colchester Road. Everywhere they were forced back by superior numbers. The enemy were fast closing in upon us. It was a terrible night in Chelmsford. There was panic on every hand. A man mounted the Tyndall statue and harangued the crowd, urging the people to rise and compel the government to stop the war. A few men endeavored to load the old Crimean cannon in front of the Shire Hall, but found it clogged with rust and useless. People fled from the villa residences in Brentwood Road into the town for safety now that the enemy were upon them. The banks in High Street were being barricaded 
and the store still remaining in the various grocer's shop, Luck and Smith's, Martin's, Cramphorn's, and Perk's, were rapidly being concealed from the invaders. All the ambulance wagons entering the town were filled with wounded, although as many as possible were sent south by train. By one o'clock in the morning, however, most of the civilian inhabitants had fled. The streets were empty, but for the bivouacking troops and the never-ending procession of wounded men. The general and his staff were deliberating to a late hour in the Shire Hall at which he had established his headquarters. The booming of the guns waxed and waned till dawn, when a furious outburst announced that the second act of the tragedy was about to open. Decree Concerning the Powers of Councils of War We, Governor-General of East Anglia, in virtue of the powers conferred upon us by His Imperial Majesty the German Emperor, Commander-in-Chief of the German Armies, order for the maintenance of the internal and external security of the counties of the Government General. Article 1. Any individual guilty of incendiarism or of willful inundation of attack or of resistance with violence against the Government General or the agents of the civil or military authorities, of sedition, of pillage, of theft with violence, of assisting prisoners to escape, or of exciting soldiers to treasonable acts, shall be punished by death. In the case of any extenuating circumstances, the culprit may be sent to penal servitude with hard labor for twenty years. Article 2. Any person provoking or inciting an individual to commit the crimes mentioned in Article 1 will be sent to penal servitude with hard labor for ten years. Article 3. Any person propagating false reports relative to the operations of war or political events will be imprisoned for one year and fined up to one hundred pounds. In any case where the affirmation or propagation may cause prejudice against the German army or against any authorities of functionaries established by it, the culprit will be sent to hard labor for ten years. Article 4. Any person usurping a public office or who commits any act or issues any order in the name of a public functionary will be imprisoned for five years and fined one hundred and fifty pounds. Article 5. Any person who voluntarily destroys or abstracts any document, registers, archives, or public documents deposited in public offices or passing through their hands in virtue of their functions as government or civic officials will be imprisoned for two years and fined one hundred and fifty pounds. Article 6. Any person obliterating, damaging, or tearing down official notices, orders, or proclamations of any sort issued by the German authorities will be imprisoned for six months and fined eighty pounds. Article 7. Any resistance or disobedience on any order given in the interests of public security by military commanders and other authorities or any provocation or excitement to commit such disobedience will be punished by one year's imprisonment or a fine of not less than one hundred and fifty pounds. Article 8. Any offenses enumerated in Articles 1 through 7 are within the jurisdiction of the Councils of War. Article 9. It is within the competence of the Councils of War to adjudicate upon all other crimes and offenses against the internal and external security of the English provinces occupied by the German army and also upon all crimes against the military or civilian authorities or their agents, as well as murder, the fabrication of false money, of blackmail, and all other serious offenses. Article 10. Independent of the above, the military jurisdiction already proclaimed will remain in force regarding all actions tending to imperil the security of the German troops, to damage their interests, or to render assistance to the army of the British government. Consequently, there will be punished by death, and we expressly repeat this, all persons who are not British soldiers and, a, who serve the British army or the government as spies or receive British spies or give them assistance or asylum, b, who serves as guides to British troops or mislead the German troops when charged to act as guides, c, who shoot, injure, or assault any German soldier or officer. D. 
who destroy bridges or canals, interrupt railways or telegraph lines, render roads impassable, burn munitions of war, provisions, or quarters of the troops. E. Who take arms against the German troops. Article 11. The organization of councils of war mentioned in Articles 8 and 9 of the law of May 2, 1870, and their procedure are regulated by special laws which are the same as the summary jurisdiction of military tribunals. In the case of Article 10, there remains in force the law of July 21, 1867, concerning the military jurisdiction applicable to foreigners. Article 12. The present order is proclaimed and put into execution on the morrow of the day upon which it is affixed in the public places of each town and village, the Governor-General of East Anglia, Count von Schoenberg Waldenberg, Lieutenant-General. Norwich, September 7, 1910. I had betaken myself at once to the round tower of the church, next the stone bridge, from which I had an excellent view both east and north. The first thing that attracted my eye was the myriad flashings of rifle fire in the dimness of the breaking day. They reached in a continuous line of coruscations from Borham Hall, opposite my right hand, to the knoll by Little Waltham, a distance of three or four miles, I should say. The enemy were driving in all our outlying and advanced troops by sheer weight of numbers. Presently the heavy batteries at Danbury began pitching shell over in the direction of the firing, but as the German line still advanced, it had not apparently any very great effect. The next thing that happened was a determined attack on the village of Howe Street, made from the direction of Hyde Hall. This is about two miles north of Little Waltham. In spite of our incessant fire, the Germans had contrived to mass a tremendous number of guns and howitzers on and behind the knoll they captured last night, and there was any quantity more on the ridge above Hyde Hall. All these terrible weapons concentrated their fire for a few moments on the blackened ruins of Howe Street. Not a mouse could have lived there. The little place was simply pulverized. Our guns at Plushy Mount and Rolfe Green, aided by a number of field batteries, in vain endeavored to make head against them. They were outnumbered by six to one. Under cover of this tornado of iron and fire, the enemy pushed several battalions over the river, making use of the ruins of the many bridges about there which had been hastily destroyed, and which they repaired with planks and other materials they brought along with them. They lost a large number of men in the process, but they persevered, and by ten o'clock were in complete possession of Howe Street, Langley's Park, and Great Waltham, and moving in fighting formation against Pleshy Mount and Rolfe Green, their guns covering their advance, with a perfectly awful discharge of shrapnel. Our cannon on the ridge at Partridge Green took the attackers in flank, and for a time checked their advance, but drawing upon themselves the attention of the German artillery on the south end of the knoll, were all but silenced. As soon as this was effected, another strong column of Germans followed in the footsteps of the first, and deploying to the left, secured the bridge at Little Waltham, and advanced against the gun positions on Partridge Green. This move turned all our riverbank entrenchments right down to Chelmsford. Their defenders were now treated to the enfilade fire of a number of Hanoverian batteries that galloped down to Little Waltham. They stuck to their trenches gallantly, but presently when the enemy obtained a footing on Partridge Green they were taken in reverse and compelled to fall back, suffering terrible losses as they did so. The whole of the infantry of the Tenth Corps supported, as we understand, by a division which had joined them from Malden, now moved down on Chelmsford. In fact, there was a general advance of the three combined armies stretching from Partridge Green on the west to the railway line on the east. The defenders of the trenches facing east were hastily withdrawn and thrown back on Riddle. The Germans followed closely with both infantry and guns, though they were for a time checked near Scott's Green by a dashing charge of our cavalry brigade, consisting of the 16th Lancers and the 7th, 14th, and 20th Hussars, and the Essex and Middlesex Yeomanry. We saw nothing of their cavalry, for a reason that will be apparent later. By one o'clock fierce fighting was going on all round the town, the German hordes enveloping it on all sides but one.
we had lost a great number of our guns, or at any rate had been cut off from them by the German successes around Fleshy Mount, and in all their assaults on the town they had been careful to keep out of effective range of the heavy batteries on Danbury Hill. These, by the way, had their own work cut out for them, as the Saxon artillery were heavily bombarding the hill with their howitzers. The British forces were in a critical situation. Reinforcements, such as could be spared, were hurried up from the Fifth Army Corps, but they were not very many in numbers, as it was necessary to provide against an attack by the Saxon Corps. By three o'clock the greater part of the town was in the hands of the Germans, despite the gallant way in which our men fought them from street to street and house to house. A dozen fires were spreading in every direction, and fierce fighting was going on at Riddle. The overpowering numbers of the Germans, combined with their better organization, and the number of properly trained officers at their disposal, bore the British mixed regular and irregular forces back and back again. Fearful of being cut off from his line of retreat, General Blennerhassett, on hearing from Riddle soon after three that the Hanoverians were pressing his left very hard and endeavoring to work round it, reluctantly gave orders for the troops in Chelmsford to fall back on Whitford and Malsham. There was a lull in the fighting for about half an hour, though firing was going on both at Riddle and Danbury. Soon after four a terrible rumor spread consternation on every side. According to this, an enormous force of cavalry and motor infantry was about to attack us in the rear. What had actually happened was not quite so bad as this, but quite bad enough. It seems, according to our latest information, that almost the whole of the cavalry belonging to the three German army corps with whom we were engaged, something like a dozen regiments, with a proportion of horse artillery and all available motorists, having with them several of the new armored motors carrying light quick firing and machine guns had been massed during the last thirty-six hours behind the Saxon lines extending from Malden to the river Crouch. During the day they had worked round to the southward, and at the time the rumor reached us were actually attacking Billericay, which was held by a portion of the reserves of our Fifth Corps. By the time this news was confirmed the Germans were assaulting Great Badau and moving on Danbury from east, north, and west at the same time resuming the offensive all along the line. The troops at Danbury must be withdrawn, or they would be isolated. This difficult maneuver was executed by way of West Hanningfield. The rest of the Fifth Corps conformed to the movement, the Guards' Brigade at East Hanningfield forming the rear guard, and fighting fiercely all night through the Saxon troops who moved out on the left flank of our retreat. The wreck of the First Corps and the Colchester garrison was now also in full retirement. Ten miles lay between it and the lines at Brentwood, and had the Germans been able to employ cavalry in pursuit, this retreat would have been even more like a rout than it was. Luckily for us, the Billericay troops mauled the German cavalry pretty severely, and they were beset in the close country in that neighborhood by volunteers, motorists, and every one that the officer commanding at Brentwood could get together in this emergency. Some of them actually got upon our line of retreat, but were driven off by our advance guard. Others came across the head of the retiring Fifth Corps, but the terrain was all against cavalry, and after nightfall most of them had lost their way in the maze of lanes and hedgerows that covered the countryside. Had it not been for this, we should probably have been absolutely smashed. As it was, rather more than half our original numbers of men and guns crawled into Brentwood in the early morning, worn out and dead beat. Reports from Sheffield also showed the position to be critical. End of chapter 11 and book 1. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Book 2 of The Invasion by William LeCue this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Book Two, The Siege of London. Chapter One, The Lines of London. The German successes were continued in the North and Midlands, and notwithstanding the gallant defense of Sir George Woolmer before Manchester and Sir Henry Hibbert before Birmingham, 
both cities were captured and occupied by the enemy after terrible losses. London, however, was the chief objective of von Kronhelm, and towards the metropolis he now turned his attention. After the defeat of the British at Chelmsford on that fateful Wednesday, Lord Byfield decided to evacuate his position at Royston and fall back on the northern section of the London defence line, which had been under construction for the last ten days. These hasty entrenchments, which would have been impossible to construct but for the ready assistance of thousands of all classes of the citizens of London and the suburbs, extended from Tilbury on the east to Bushy on the west, passing by the Langdon Hills, Brentwood, Kelvedon, North Weald, Epping, Waltham Abbey, Cheshun, Enfield Chase, Chipping Barnet, and Elstree. They were more or less continuous, consisting for the most part of trenches for infantry, generally following the lines of existing hedgerows or banks, which often required but little improvement to transform them into well-protected and formidable cover for the defending troops. Where it was necessary to cross open ground, they were dug deep and winding, after the fashion adopted by the Boers in the South African War, so that it would be difficult, if not impossible, to enfilade them. Special bomb-proof covers for the local reserves were also constructed at various points, and the ground in front ruthlessly cleared of houses, barns, trees, hedges, and everything that might afford shelter to an advancing enemy. Every possible military obstacle was placed in front of the lines that time permitted. Apathy, military pits, wire entanglements, and small ground mines. At the more important points along the fifty miles of entrenchments, field work and redoubts for infantry were built, most of them being armed with four, seven, or even six or seven point five inch guns, which had been brought from Woolwich, Chatham, Portsmouth, and Devonport, and mounted on whatever carriages could be adapted or improvised for the occasion. The preparation of the London lines was a stupendous undertaking but the growing scarceness and dearness of provisions assisted in a degree as no free rations were issued to any able-bodied man unless he went out to work at the fortifications. All workers were placed under military law. There were any number of willing workers who proffered their services in this time of peril. Thousands of men came forward asking to be enlisted and armed. The difficulty was to find enough weapons and ammunition for them to say nothing of the question of uniform and equipment which loomed very large indeed. The attitude of the Germans, as set forth in von Kronhelm's proclamations, precluded the employment of fighting men dressed in civilian garb, and their attitude was a perfectly natural and justifiable one by all the laws and customs of war. It became necessary, therefore, that all men sent to the front should be dressed as soldiers in some way or another. In addition to that splendid corps, the Legion of Frontiersmen, many new armed organizations had sprung into being, some bearing the most fantastic names, such as the Whitechapel War to the Knives, the Kensington Cowboys, the Bayswater Braves, and the Southwark Scalp Hunters. All the available khaki and blue serge was used up in no time. Even though those who were already in possession of ordinary lounge suits of the latter material were encouraged to have them altered into uniforms by the addition of stand-up collars and facings of various colors, according to their regiments and corps. Only the time during which these men were waiting for their uniforms was spent in drill in the open spaces of the metropolis. As soon as they were clothed, they were dispatched to that portion of the entrenchments to which their corps had been allocated, and there, in the intervals of their clearing and digging operations, they were hustled through a brief musketry course which consisted for the most part in firing. The question of the provision of officers and NCOs was an almost insuperable one. Retired men came forward on every side, but the supply was by no means equal to the demand, and they themselves in many instances were as absolutely out of date as far as knowledge of modern arms and conditions were concerned. However, everyone, with but very few exceptions, did his utmost, and by the eleventh or twelfth of the month the entrenchments were practically completed and manned by upwards of one hundred and fifty thousand men with muskets, of stout heart and full of patriotism, but in reality 
nothing but an army pourri so far as efficiency was concerned. The greater part of the guns were also placed in position, especially on the north and eastern portions of the lines, and the remainder were being mounted as fast as it was practicable. They were well manned by volunteer and militia artillerymen, drawn from every district which the invaders had left accessible. By the 13th the eastern section of the fortifications was strengthened by the arrival of the remnants of the 1st and 5th Army Corps, which had been so badly defeated at Chelmsford, and no time was lost in reorganizing them and distributing them along the lines, thereby to a certain extent leavening the unbaked mass of their improvised defenders. It was generally expected that the enemy would follow up the success by an immediate attack on Brentwood, the main barrier between von Kronhelm and his objective, our great metropolis. But as it turned out, he had a totally different scheme in hand. The orders to Lord Byfield to evacuate the position he had maintained with such credit against the German Guard and Fourth Corps have already been referred to. Their reason was obvious. Now that there was no organized resistance on his right, he stood in danger of being cut off from London, the defenses of which were now in pressing need of his men. A large amount of rolling stock was at once dispatched to Saffron Walden and Buntingford by the G.E.R. and to Baldock by the G.N.R. to facilitate the withdrawal of his troops and stores, and he was given an absolutely free hand as to how these were to be used, all lines being kept clear and additional trains kept at his disposal at their London termini. September 13th proved a memorable day in the history of England. The evacuation of the baldock saffron walden position could not possibly have been carried out in good order on such notice had not Lord Byfield previously worked the whole thing out in readiness. He could not help feeling that, despite his glorious victory on the ninth, a turn of fortune's wheel might necessitate a retirement on London sooner or later, and, like the good general that he was, he made every preparation both for this and other eventualities. Among other details he had arranged that the mounted infantry should be provided with plenty of strong light wire. This was intended for the express benefit of Furlick's formidable cavalry brigade, which he foresaw would be most dangerous to his command in the event of a retreat. As soon, therefore, as the retrograde movement commenced, the mounted infantry began to stretch their wires across every road, lane, and byway leading to the north and northeast. Some wires were laid low within a foot of the ground, others high up where they could catch a rider about the neck or breast. This operation they carried out again and again after the troops had passed at various points on the route of the retreat. Thanks to the darkness, this device well fulfilled its purpose. Frölich's brigade was on the heels of the retreating British soon after midnight, but as it was impossible for them to move over the enclosed country at night, his riders were confined to the roads, and the accidents and delays occasioned by the wires were so numerous and disconcerting that their advance had to be conducted with such caution that as a pursuit it was of no use at all. Even the infantry and heavy guns of the retiring British got over the ground nearly twice as fast. After two or three hours of this, only varied by occasional volleys from detachments of our mounted infantry, who sometimes waited in rear of their snares to let fly at the German cavalry before galloping back to lay others, the enemy recognized the fact, and, withdrawing their cavalry till daylight, replaced them by infantry, but so much time had been lost that the British had got several miles start. As has been elsewhere chronicled, the brigade of four regular battalions with their guns, and a company of engineers which were to secure the passage of the stork and protect the left flank of the retirement, left Saffron Walden somewhere about 10.30 p.m. The line was clear, and they arrived at Sawbridgeworth in four long trains in a little under an hour. Their advent did not arouse the sleeping village, as the station lies nearly three-quarters of a mile distant on the further side of the river. It may be noted in passing that while the Stort is but a small stream, easily fordable in most places, yet it was important, if possible, to secure the bridges to prevent delay in getting over the heavy guns and wagons of the retiring British. 
a delay and congestion at the point selected for passage might, with a close pursuit, easily lead to disaster. Moreover, the Great Eastern Railway crossed the river by a wooden bridge just north of the village of Sawbridgeworth, and it was necessary to ensure the safe passage of the last trains over it before destroying it to preclude the use of the railway by the enemy. There were two road bridges on the Great Eastern Railway near the village of Sawbridgeworth which might be required by the Dunmow force, which was detailed to protect the same flank rather more to the northward. The most important bridge, that over which the main body of the Saffron Walden force was to retire, with all the impedimenta it had time to bring away with it, was between Sawbridgeworth and Harlow, about a mile north of the latter village, but much nearer its station. Thither, then, proceeded the leading train with the grenadiers, four seven guns, and half a company of royal engineers with bridging materials. Their task was to construct a second bridge to relieve the traffic over the permanent one. The grenadiers left one company at the railway station, two in Harlow Village, which they at once commenced to place in a state of defense, much to the consternation of the villagers, who had not realized how close to them were trending the red footsteps of war. The remaining five companies with the other four guns turned northward, and, after marching another mile or so, occupied the enclosures round Durrington House and the higher ground to its north. Here the guns were halted on the road. It was too dark to select the best position for them, but it was now only about half an hour after midnight. The three other regiments which detrained at Sawbridgeworth were disposed as follows, continuing the line of the grenadiers to the northward. The rifles, occupied Hyde Hall, formerly the seat of the Earls of Roden, covering the operations of the engineers, who were preparing the railway bridge for destruction, and the copses about Little Hyde Hall on the higher ground to the eastward. The Scots guards with four guns were between them and the grenadiers, and distributed between Sharing Village and Gladwin's house from the neighborhood of which it was expected that the guns would be able to command the Chelmsford Road for a considerable distance. The Seaforth Highlanders, for the time being, were stationed on a road running parallel to the railway, from which branch roads led to both the right, left, and center of the position. An advanced party of the rifle brigade was pushed forward to Hatfield Heath with instructions to patrol towards the front and flanks, and, if possible, establish communication with the troops expected from Dunmow. By the time all this was completed, it was getting on for 3 a.m. on the 13th. At this hour the advance guard of the Germans, coming from Chelmsford, was midway between Leaden Roading and White Roading, while the main body was crossing the small river Roading by the shallow ford near the latter village. Their few cavalry scouts were, however, exploring the roads and lanes some little way ahead. A collision was imminent. The Dunmow force had not been able to move before midnight, and, with the exception of one regular battalion, the first Leinsters, which was left behind to the last and crowded into the only train available, had only just arrived at the northern edge of Hatfield Forest, some four miles directly north of Hatfield Heath. The Leinsters, who left Dunmow by train half an hour later, had detrained at this point at one o'clock, and just about three had met the patrols of the rifles. A yeomanry corps from Dunmow was also not far off, as it turned to its left at the crossroads east of Takeley, and was by this time in the neighborhood of Hatfield Broad Oak. In short, all three forces were converging, but the bulk of the Dunmow force was four miles away from the point of convergence. It was still profoundly dark when the rifles at Hatfield Heath heard a dozen shots cracking through the darkness to their left front. Almost immediately other reports resounded from due east. Nothing could be seen beyond the very few yards, and the men of the advanced company drawn up at the crossroads in front of the village fancied they now and again saw figures dodging about in obscurity, but were cautioned not to fire till their patrols had come in, for it was impossible to distinguish friend from foe. Shots still rattled out here and there to the front. About ten minutes later the captain in command, having got in his patrols, gave the order to fire at the black blur that seemed to be moving towards them on the Chelmsford Road. There was no mistake this time. 
The momentary glare of the discharge flashed on the shiny pickle hobs of a detachment of German infantry who charged forward with a loud hock. The riflemen, who already had their bayonets fixed, rushed to meet them, and for a few moments there was a fierce stabbing affray in the blackness of the night. The Germans, who were but few in number, were overpowered, and beat a retreat, having lost several of their men. The rifles, according to their orders, having made sure of the immediate proximity of the enemy, now fell back to the rest of their battalion at Little Hyde Hall, and all along the banks and hedges which covered the British front, our men, rifle in hand, peered eagerly into the darkness ahead of them. Nothing happened for quite half an hour, and the anxious watchers were losing some of their alertness when a heavy outburst of firing re-echoed from Hatfield Heath. To this we must return to the Germans. Von der Rudeschein, on obtaining touch with the British, at once reinforced his advanced troops, and they, a whole battalion strong, advanced into the hamlet, meeting with no resistance. Almost simultaneously two companies of the Leinsters entered it from the northward. There was a terrible and unexpected collision on the open green, and a terrible fire was exchanged at close quarters, both sides losing very heavily. The British, however, were borne back by sheer weight of numbers, and, through one of those unfortunate mistakes that insist on occurring in warfare, were charged as they fell back by the leading squadrons of the yeomanry who were coming up from Hatfield Broad Oak. The officer commanding the Leinsters decided to wait till it was a little lighter before again attacking the village. He considered that, as he had no idea of the strength of the enemy, he had best wait till the arrival of the troops now marching through Hatfield Forest. Von der Rudeschein, on his part, mindful of his instructions, determined to try to hold the few scattered houses on the north side of the heath which constituted the village, with the battalion already in it, and push forward with the remainder of his force towards Harlow. His first essay along the road via Shearing was repulsed by the fire of the Scots guards lining the copses about Gladwins. He now began to have some idea of the British position and made his preparations to assault it at daybreak. To this end he sent forward two of his batteries into Hatfield Heath, cautiously moved the rest of his force away to the left, arranged his battalions in the valley of the Pincy Brook, ready for attacking Shearing and Gladwins, placed one battalion in reserve at Down Hall, and stationed his remaining battery near Newman's End. By this time there was beginning to be a faint glimmer of daylight in the east, and as the growing dawn began to render some vague outlines of the nearer objects dimly discernible, hell broke loose along the peaceful countryside. A star-shell fired from the battery at Newman's End burst and hung out a brilliant white blaze that fell slowly over Shearing Village, lighting up its walls and roofs, and the hedges along which lay its defenders was the signal for the devil's dance to begin. Twelve guns opened with a crash from Hatfield Heath, raking the Gladwin's enclosures and the end of Shearing Village with a deluge of shrapnel, whilst an almost solid firing line advanced rapidly against it, firing heavily. The British replied lustily with gun, rifle, and maxim, the big high-explosive shells bursting amid the advancing Germans and among the houses of Hatfield Heath with telling effect. But the German assaulting lines had but six or seven hundred yards to go. They had been trained above all things to ignore losses and to push on at all hazards. The necessity for this had not been confused in their mind by maxims about the importance of cover, so the south side of the village street was taken at a rush. Von der Rudenstein continued to pile on his men, and, fighting desperately, the guardsmen were driven from house to house and from fence to fence. All this time the German battery at Newman's End continued to fire star shells with rhythmical regularity lighting up the inflamed countenances of the living combatants, and the pale upturned faces of the dead turned to heaven as if calling for vengeance on their slayers. In the midst of this desperate fighting the Leinsters, supported by a volunteer and a militia regiment which had just come up, assaulted Hatfield Heath. The Germans were driven out of it with the loss of a couple of their guns, but hung on to the little church around which such a desperate conflict was waged that the dead above ground in that diminutive god's acre outnumbered the rude forebearers of the hamlet, who slept below. It was now past five o'clock in the morning, 
and by this time strong reinforcements might have been expected from Dunmow, but, with the exception of the militia and volunteer battalions just referred to, who had pushed on at the sound of the firing, none were seen coming up. The fact was that they had been told off to certain positions in the line of defense they had been ordered to take up, and had been slowly and carefully installing themselves therein. Their commanding officer, Sir Jacob Stellenbosch, thought that he must carry out the exact letter of the orders he had received from Lord Byfield, and paid little attention to the firing except to hustle his battalion commanders to try to get them into their places as soon as possible. He was a pig-headed man into the bargain, and would listen to no remonstrance. The two battalions which had arrived so opportunely had been at the head of the column, and had pushed forward on their own before he could prevent them. At this time the position was as follows. One German battalion was hanging obstinately onto the outskirts of Hatfield Heath. Two were in possession of the copses about Gladwins. Two were in Shearing Village, or close up to it, and the sixth was still in reserve at Down Hall. On the British side the rifles were in their original position at Little Hyde Hall, where also were three guns which had been got away from the Gladwins. The sea force had come up and were now firing from about Quickbury, while the Scots guards, after suffering fearful losses, were scattered, some with the Highlanders, others with the five companies of the Grenadiers, who with their four guns still fought gallantly on between Shearing and Durrington House. End of chapter one. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com. Chapter Two of the Invasion by William LeCue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Two Repulse of the Germans. The terrible fire of the swarms of Germans who now lined the edges of Shearing Village became too much for the four, four, seven guns in the open ground to the south. Their gunners were shot down as fast as they touched their weapons and when the German field battery at Newman's End, which had been advanced several hundred yards, suddenly opened a flanking fire of shrapnel upon them, it was found absolutely impossible to serve them. A gallant attempt was made to withdraw them by the Harlow Road, but their teams were shot down as soon as they appeared. This enfilade fire, too, decimated the grenadiers and the remnant of the Scots, though they fought on to the death and a converging attack of a battalion from Down Hall and another from Shearing drove them down into the grounds of Durrington House, where fighting still went on savagely for some time afterwards. Von der Rudesheim had all but attained a portion of his object, which was to establish his guns in such a position that they could fire on the main body of the British troops when they entered Sawbridgeworth by the Cambridge Road. The place where the four guns with the grenadiers had been stationed was within three thousand yards of any part of that road between Harlow and Sawbridgeworth. But this spot was still exposed to the rifle fire of the sea force who held Quickbury. Van der Rudesheim, therefore, determined to swing forward his left and either drive them back down the hill towards the river, or at least to so occupy them that he could bring up his field guns to their chosen position without losing too many of his gunners. By six o'clock, thanks to his enormous local superiority in numbers, he had contrived to do this, and now the opposing forces, with the exception of the British grenadiers, who still fought with the German battalion between Durrington House and Harlow, faced each other north and south, instead of east and west as they were at the beginning of the fight. Brigadier General Lane Edgeworth, who was in command of the British, had been sending urgent messages for reinforcements to the Dunmow force, but when its commanding officer finally decided to turn his full strength in the direction of the firing, it took so long to assemble and form up the volunteer regiments who composed the bulk of his command that it was past seven before the leading battalion had deployed to assist in the attack which it was decided to make against the German right. Meantime, other important events had transpired. Von Rudensheim had found that the battalion which was engaged with the Grenadiers could not get near Harlow Village or either the river or railway bridge at that place, both of which he wished to destroy. But his scouts had reported a lock and wooden footbridge immediately to the westward between Harlow and Sawbridgeworth, 
just abreast of the large wooded park surrounding Pishaberry House on the farther side. He determined to send two companies over by this, their movements being hidden from the English by the trees. After crossing, they found themselves confronted by a backwater, but, trained in crossing rivers, they managed to ford and swim over and advance through the park towards Harlow Bridge. While this was in progress, a large force was reported marching south on the Cambridge Road. While von der Rudesheim, who was at the western end of Shearing Hamlet, was looking through his glasses at the new arrivals on the scene of action, who were without doubt the main body of the Royston Command, which was retiring under the personal supervision of Lord Byfield, a puff of white smoke rose above the trees about Hyde Hall, and at top speed four heavily loaded trains shot into sight going south. These were the same ones that had brought down the regular British troops with whom he was now engaged. They had gone north again and picked up a number of volunteer battalions belonging to the retreating force just beyond Bishop Stortford but so long a time had been taken in entraining the troops in the darkness and confusion of the retreat that their comrades who had kept to the road arrived almost simultaneously. Von der Rudesheim signaled and sent urgent orders for his guns to be brought up to open fire on them, but by the time the first team had reached him the last of the trains had disappeared from sight into the cutting at Harlow Station. But even now it was not too late to open fire on the troops entering Sawbridgeworth. Things were beginning to look somewhat bad for von der Udesheim's little force. The pressure from the north was increasing every moment, his attack on the retreating troops had failed, he had not so far been able to destroy the bridges at Harlow, and every minute the likelihood of his being able to do so grew more remote. To crown all, word was brought him that the trains which had just slipped by were disgorging men in hundreds along the railway west of Harlow Station, and that these troops were beginning to move forward as if to support the British grenadiers who had been driven back towards Harlow. In fact, he saw that there was even a possibility of his being surrounded. But he had no intention of discontinuing the fight. He knew he could rely on the discipline and mobility of his well-trained men under almost any conditions, and he trusted, moreover, that the promised reinforcements would not be very long in turning up. But he could not hold on just where he was. He accordingly, by various adroit maneuvers, threw back his right to Down Hall, whose copses and plantations afforded a good deal of cover, and, using this as a pivot, gradually wheeled back his left till he had taken up a position running north and south from Down Hall to Matching Tie. He had not effected this difficult maneuver without considerable loss, but he experienced less difficulty in extricating his left than he had anticipated, since the newly arrived British troops at Harlow, instead of pressing forward against him, had been engaged in moving into a position between Harlow and the hamlet of Foster Street, on the somewhat elevated ground to the south of Matching, which would enable them to cover the further march of the main body of the retreating troops to Epping but he had totally lost the two companies he had sent across the river to attack Harlow Bridge. Unfortunately for them, their arrival on the harlow Sawbridgeworth Road synchronized with that of the advanced guard of Lord Byfield's command. Some hot skirmishing took place in and out among the trees of Pishaberry, and finally the Germans were driven to earth in the big square block of the red-brick mansion itself. Here they made a desperate stand, fighting hard as they were driven from one story to another. The staircases ran with blood, the woodwork smoldered and threatened to burst into flame in a dozen places. At length the arrival of a battery of field guns, which unlimbered at close range, induced the survivors to surrender, and they were disarmed and carried off as prisoners with the retreating army. By the time von der Rudesheim had succeeded in taking up his new position, it was past ten o'clock and he had been informed by dispatches carried by motorcyclists that he might expect assistance in another hour and a half. The right column, consisting of the 39th Infantry Brigade of five battalions, six batteries, and a squadron of dragoons, came into collision with the left flank of the Dunmau force, which was engaged in attacking von der Rudesheim's right at Down Hall and endeavoring to surround it. 
Sir Jacob Stellenbosch, who was in command, in vain tried to change front to meet the advancing enemy. His troops were nearly all volunteers who were incapable of quickly maneuvering under difficult circumstances. They were crumpled up and driven back in confusion towards Hatfield Heath. Had von Kromhelm been able to get in the bulk of his cavalry from their luckless pursuit of the 1st and 5th British Army Corps, who had been driven back on Brentwood the evening previous, and so sent a proportion with the 20th Division, few would have escaped to tell the tale. As it was, the unfortunate volunteers were shot down in scores by the few d'Enfi with which the artillery followed them up, and lay in twos and threes and larger groups all over the field, victims of a selfish nation that accepted those poor fellows' gratuitous services merely in order that its citizens should not be obliged to carry out what in every other European country was regarded as the first duty of citizenship, that of learning to bear arms in the defense of the fatherland. By this time the greater portion of the retreating British army, with all its baggage, guns in impedimenta, was crawling slowly along the road from Harlow to Epping. Unaccustomed as they were to marching, the poor volunteers who had already covered eighteen or twenty miles of road were now toiling slowly and painfully along the highway. The regular troops, who had been engaged since early morning, and who were now mostly in the neighborhood of Moor Hall, east of Harlow, firing at long ranges on von Rudersheim's men to keep them in their places, while Sir Jacob Stellenbosch attacked their right, were now hurriedly withdrawn, and started to march south by a track running parallel to the main Epping Road, between it and that along which the covering force of volunteers, who had come in by train, were now established in position. The first and second cold streamers, who had formed Lord Byfield's rear guard during the night, were halted in Harlow Village. Immediately upon the success obtained by his right column, General Richel von Seeberg, who commanded the 20th Hanoverian Division, ordered his two center and left columns, consisting respectively of the three battalions, 77th Infantry, and two batteries of horse artillery, then at Matching Green, and the three battalions, 92nd Infantry, 10th Pioneer Battalion, and five batteries field artillery, then between High Laver and Tilegate Green, to turn their left and advance in fighting formation in a southwesterly direction, with the object of attacking the sorely harassed troops of Lord Byfield on their way to Epping. The final phase of this memorable retreat is best told in the words of the special war correspondent of the Daily Telegraph, who arrived on the scene at about one o'clock in the afternoon. Epping, 5 p.m., September 9. Thanks to the secrecy preserved by the military authorities, it was not known that Lord Byfield was falling back from the Royston Saffron Walden position till seven this morning. By eight I was off in my car for the scene of action, for rumors of fighting near Harlow had already begun to come in. I started out by way of Tottenham and Edmonton, expecting to reach Harlow by nine thirty or ten but I reckoned without the numerous military officials with whom I came in contact, who constantly stopped me and sent me out of my way on one pretext or another. I am sure I hope that the nation has benefited by their proceedings. In the end it was close on one before I pulled up at the Cock Inn, Epping, in search of additional information, because for some time I had been aware of the rumbling growl of heavy artillery from the eastward and wondered what it might portend. I found that General Sir Stapleton Forsyth, who commanded the northern section of the defenses, had made the inn his headquarters, and there was a constant coming and going of orderlies and staff officers at its portals. Opposite, the men of one of the new irregular corps, dressed in dark green corduroy, blue flannel cricketing caps, and red cummerbunds, sat or reclined in two long lines on either side of their piled arms on the left of the wide street. On inquiry, I heard that the enemy was said to be bombarding Kelvinton Hatch, and also that the head of our retreating columns was only three or four miles distant. I pushed on, and, after the usual interrogations from an officer in charge of a picket where the road ran through the entrenchments about a mile farther on, found myself spinning along through the country in the direction of Harlow. As I began to ascend the rising ground towards Potter Street, 
I could hear a continuous roll of artillery away to my right. I could not distinguish anything except the smoke of shells bursting here and there in the distance, on account of the scattered trees which lined the maze of hedgerows on every side. Close to Potter Street I met the head of the retreating army. Very tired, heated and footsore looked the hundreds of poor fellows as they dragged themselves along through the heat. It was a sultry afternoon, and the roads inches deep in dust. Turning to the right of Harlow Common I met another column of men. I noticed that these were all regulars, grenadiers, Scots guards, a battalion of Highlanders, another of riflemen, and lastly two battalions of the cold streamers. These troops stepped along with rather more life than the citizen soldiers I had met previously, but still showed traces of their hard marching and fighting. Many of them were wearing bandages, but all the more seriously wounded had been left behind to be looked after by the Germans. All this time the firing was still resounding heavy and constant from the northeast, and from one person and another whom I questioned I ascertained that the enemy were advancing upon us from that direction. Half a mile farther on I ran into the middle of the fighting. The road ran along the top of a kind of flat ridge or upland, whence I could see to a considerable distance on either hand. Partially sheltered from the view by its hedges and the scattered cottages forming the hamlet of Foster Street was a long irregular line of guns facing nearly east. Beyond them were yet others directed north. There were field batteries and big four sevens. All were hard at work, their gunners working like men possessed, and the crash of their constant discharge was ear-splitting. I had hardly taken this in when bang, 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 four dazzling flashes opened in the air overhead, and shrapnel bullets rattled on earth, walls and roofs with a sound as of handfuls of pebbles thrown on a marble pavement. But the hardness with which they struck was beyond anything in my experience. It was not pleasant to be here, but I ran my car behind a little public house that stood by the wayside, and, dismounting, unslung my glasses and determined to get what view of the proceedings I could from the corner of the house. All around khaki-clad volunteers lined every hedge and sheltered behind every cottage, while farther off, in the lower ground, from a mile to a mile and a half away, I could distinguish the closely packed firing lines of the Germans, advancing slowly but steadily, despite the gaps made in their ranks by the fire of our guns. Their own guns, I fancied, I could make out near Tilegate Green to the northeast. Neither side had as yet opened rifle fire. Getting into my car, I motored back to the main road, but it was so blocked by the procession of wagons and troops of the retreating army that I could not turn into it. Wheeling round, I made my way back to a parallel lane I had noticed, and turning to the left again at a smithy, found myself in a road bordered by cottages and enclosures. Here I found the regular troops I had lately met lining every hedgerow and fence, while I could see others on a knoll further to their left. There was a little church here, and mounting to the roof I got a comparatively extensive view. To my right the long dusty column of men in wagons still toiled along the Epping Road. In front, nearly three miles off, an apparently solid line of woods stretched along the horizon, surmounting a long gradual and open slope. This was the position of our lines near Epping, and the haven for which Lord Byfield's tired soldiery were making. To the left the serried masses of drab-clad German infantry still pushed aggressively forward, their guns firing heavily over their heads. As I watched them three tremendous explosions took place in their midst killing dozens of them. Fire, smoke, and dust rose up twenty feet in the air, while three ear-splitting reports rose even above the rolling thunder of the gunfire. More followed. I looked again towards the woodland. Here I saw blaze after blaze of fire among the dark masses of trees. Our big guns in the fortifications had got to work, and were punishing the Germans most severely, taking their attack in flank with the big six-inch and seven-point-five-inch projectiles. Cheers arose all along our lines as shell after shell, fired by gunners who knew to an inch the distances to every house and conspicuous tree, burst among the German ranks 
killing and maiming the invaders by hundreds. The advance paused, faltered, and, being hurriedly reinforced from the rear, once more went forward. But the big high-explosive projectiles continued to fall with such accuracy and persistence that the attackers fell sullenly back, losing heavily as they did so. The enemy's artillery now came in for attention and was also driven out of range with loss. The last stage in the retreat of Lord Byfield's command was now secured. The extended troops and guns gradually drew off from their positions, still keeping a watchful eye on the foe, and by 4.30 all were within the Epping entrenchments. All, that is to say, but the numerous killed and wounded during the running fight that had extended along the last seven or eight miles of the retreat, and the bulk of the Dunmow force under Sir Jacob Stellenbosch, which, with its commander, had been made prisoners. They had been caught between the 39th German Infantry Brigade and several regiments of cavalry that it was said had arrived from the northward soon after they were beaten at Hatfield Heath. Probably these were the advance troops of General Furlick's Cavalry Brigade. End of Chapter 2 Recording by Tom Weiss, tomsaudiobooks.com Chapter Three of the Invasion by William Lequeu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Three, Battle of Epping. The following is extracted from the Times of fifteenth September. Epping, fourteenth September, evening. I have spent a busy day, but have no very important news to record. After the repulse of the German troops attacking Lord Byfield's retreating army, and the arrival of our sorely harassed troops behind the Epping entrenchments, we saw no more of the enemy that evening. All through the night, however, there was the sound of occasional heavy gun-firing from the eastward. I have taken up my quarters at the Bell, an inn at the south end of the village, from the back of which I can get a good view to the northwest for from two to four miles. Beyond that distance the high ridge known as Epping Upland limits the prospect. The whole terrain is cut up into fields of various sizes and dotted all over with trees. Close by is a lofty red-brick water tower which has been utilized by Sir Stapleton Forsyth as a signal station. Away about a mile to my left front, as I look from the back of the bell, a big block of buildings stands prominently out on a grassy spur of high ground. This is Copt Hall and Little Copt Hall. Both mansions have been transformed into fortresses which, while offering little or no resistance to artillery fire, will yet form a tough nut for the Germans to crack should they succeed in getting through our entrenchments at that point. Beyond I can just see a corner of a big earthwork that has been built to strengthen the defense line and which has been christened Fort Obelisk from a farm of that name near which it is situated. There is another smaller redoubt on the slope just below this hostelry, and I can see the gunners busy about the three big khaki-painted guns which are mounted in it. There are a six-inch and two four-point-seven-inch guns, I believe. This morning our cavalry, consisting of a regiment of yeomanry and some mounted infantry, who had formed a portion of Lord Byfield's force, went out to reconnoitre towards the north and east. They were not away long, as they were driven back in every direction in which they attempted to advance by superior forces of the enemy's cavalry, who seemed to swarm everywhere. Later on, I believe, some of the German riders became so venturesome that several squadrons exposed themselves to the fire of the big guns in the fort at Skip's Corner, and suffered pretty severely for their temerity. The firing continued throughout the morning, away to eastward. At noon I thought I would run down and see if I could find anything out about it. I therefore mounted my car and ran off in that direction. I found that there was a regular duel going on between our guns at Kelvedon Hatch and some heavy siege guns or howitzers that the enemy had got in the neighborhood of the high ground about Norton Heath, only about three thousand yards distant from our entrenchments. They did not appear to have done us much damage, but neither in all probability did we hurt them very much, since our gunners were unable to exactly locate the hostile guns. 
when I got back to Epping, about three o'clock, I found the wide single street full of troops. They were those who had come in the previous afternoon with Lord Byfield, and who, having been allowed to rest till midday after their long fighting march, were now being told off to their various sections of the defense line. The guard regiments were allocated to the northernmost position between Fort Royston and Fort Skips. The rifles would go to Copt Hall, and the sea force to form the nucleus of a central reserve of militia and volunteers which was being established just north of Gaines Park. Epping itself and the contiguous entrenchments were confided to the Leinster Regiment, which alone of Sir Jacob Stollenbosch's brigade had escaped capture, supported by two militia battalions. The field batteries were distributed under shelter of the woods on the south, east, and northeast of the town. During the afternoon the welcome news arrived that the remainder of Lord Byfield's command from Baldock, Royston, and Elmden had safely arrived within our entrenchments at Enfield and New Barnet. We may now hope that what with regulars, militia, volunteers, and the new levies, our lines are fully and effectively manned, and will suffice to stay the further advance of even such a formidable host as is that at the disposal of the renowned von Kronhelm. It is reported, too, from Brentwood, that great progress has already been made in reorganizing and distributing the broken remnants of the First and Fifth Armies that got back to that town after the great and disastrous Battle of Chelmsford. Victorious as they were, the Germans must also have suffered severely, which may give us some breathing time before their next onslaught. The following are extracts from a diary picked up by a Daily Telegraph correspondent lying near the body of a German officer after the fighting in the neighborhood of Enfield Chase. It is presumed that the officer in question was Major Splitberger of the Kaiser Franz Guard Grenadier Regiment, since that was the name written inside the cover of the diary. From enquiries that have since been instituted, it is probable that the deceased officer was employed on the staff of the general commanding the Fourth Corps of the invading army, though it would seem from the contents of his diary that he saw also a good deal of the operations of the Tenth Corps. Our readers will be able to gather from it the general course of the enemy's strategy and tactics during the time immediately preceding the most recent disasters which have befallen our brave defenders. The first extract is dated September 15, and was written somewhere north of Epping. September 15. So far, the bold strategy of our commander-in-chief in pushing the greater part of the Tenth Corps directly to the west immediately after our victory at Chelmsford has been amply justified by results. Although we just missed cutting off Lord Byfield and a large portion of his command at Harlow, we gained a good foothold inside the British defenses north of Epting, and I don't think it will be long before we have very much improved our position here. The Fourth Corps arrived at Harlow about midday yesterday, in splendid condition, after their long march from Newmarket, and the residue of the Tenth joined us at about the same time. As there is nothing like keeping the enemy on the move, no time was lost in preparing to attack him at the very earliest opportunity. As soon as it was dark, the Fourth Corps got its heavy guns and howitzers into position along the ridge above Epping Upland, and sent the greater portion of its field batteries forward to a position from which they were within effective range of the British fortifications at Skip's Corner. The Ninth Corps, which had arrived from Chelmsford that evening, also placed its field artillery in a similar position, from which its fire crossed that of the Fourth Corps. This corps also provided the assaulting troops. The Tenth Corps, which had been engaged all day on Thursday, was held in reserve. The howitzers on Epping Upland opened fire with petrol shell on the belt of woods that lies immediately in rear of the position to be attacked, and, with the assistance of a strong westerly wind, succeeded in setting them on fire and cutting off the most northerly section of the British defenses from reinforcement. This was soon after midnight. The conflagration not only did us this service, but it is supposed so attracted the attention of the partially trained soldiers of the enemy that they did not observe the Ninth Corps massing for the assault. We then plastered their trenches with shrapnel to such an extent that they did not dare to show a finger above them 
and finally carried the northern corner by assault. To give the enemy their due, they fought well, but we outnumbered them five to one, and it was impossible for them to resist the onslaught of our well-trained soldiers. News came today that the Saxons had been making a demonstration before Brentwood with a view of keeping the British employed down there so that they cannot send any reinforcements up here. At the same time they have been steadily bombarding Kelvedon Hatch from Norton Heath. We hear, too, that the Guard Corps have got down south, and that their front stretches from Boxbourne to Little Burke Hampstead, while Frulich's cavalry division is in front of them spread all over the country, from the River Lee away to the westward, having driven the whole of the British outlying troops and patrols under the shelter of their entrenchments. Once we succeed in rolling up the enemy's troops in this quarter, it will not be long before we are entering London. September 16. Fighting went on all yesterday in the neighborhood of Skip's Corner. We have taken the redoubt at North Weald Bassett and driven the English back into the belt of burnt woodland which they now hold along its northern edge. All day long, too, our big guns, hidden away behind the groves and woods above Epping Upland, poured their heavy projectiles on Epping and its defenses. We set the village on fire three times but the British contrived to extinguish the blaze on each occasion. I fancy Epping itself will be our next point of attack. September 17. We are still progressing. Fighting is now all but continuous. How long it may last I have no idea. Probably there will be no suspension of the struggle until we are actually masters of the metropolis. We took advantage of the darkness to push forward our men to within three thousand yards of the enemy's line, placing them as far as possible under cover of the numerous copses, plantations, and hedgerows which cover the face of this fertile country. At four a.m. the general ordered his staff to assemble at Latin Park, where he had established his headquarters. He unfolded to us the general outline of the attack, which he now announced was to commence at six precisely. I thought myself that it was a somewhat inopportune time, as we should have the rising sun right in our eyes, but I imagined that the idea was to have as much daylight as possible before us, for although we had employed a night attack against Skip's Corner, and successfully too, yet the general feeling in our army has always been opposed to operations of this kind. The possible gain is, I think, in no way commensurable with the probable risk of panic and disorder. The principal objective was the village of Epping itself, but simultaneous attacks were to be carried out against Copt Hall, Fort Obelisk to the west of it, and Fort Royston about a mile north of the village. The Ninth Corps was to cooperate by a determined attempt to break through the English lining the burnt strip of woodland and to assault the latter fort in rear. It was necessary to carry out both these flanking attacks in order to prevent the main attack from being enfiladed from right and left. At five-thirty we mounted and rode off to Rye Hill, about a couple of miles' distance, from which the general intended to watch the progress of the operations. The first rays of the rising sun were filling the eastern sky with a pale light as we cantered off, the long wooded ridge on which the enemy had his position standing up in a misty silhouette against the growing day. As we topped Rye Hill I could see the thickly massed lines of our infantry crouching behind every hedge, bank, or ridge, their rifle barrels here and there twinkling in the feeble rays of the early sun, their shadows long and attenuated behind them. Epping, with its lofty red water tower, was distinctly visible on the opposite side of the valley and it is probable that the movement of the general's cavalcade of officers with the escort attracted the attention of the enemy's lookouts, for halfway down the hillside on their side of the valley a blinding violent white flash blazed out, and a big shell came screaming along just over our heads, the loud boom of a heavy gun following fast on its heels. Almost simultaneously another big projectile hurtled up from the direction of Fort Obelisk and burst among our escort of Uhlans with a deluge of livid flame and thick volumes of greenish-brown smoke. It was a telling shot, for no fewer than six horses and their riders lay in a shattered heap on the ground. 
At six, precisely, our guns fired a salvo directed on Epping Village. This was the preconcerted signal for attack, and before the echoes of the thunderous discharge had finished reverberating over the hills and forests, our front lines had sprung to their feet and were moving at a racing pace towards the enemy. For a moment the British seemed stupefied by the suddenness of the advance. A few rifle shots crackled out here and there, but our men had thrown themselves to the ground after their first rush before the enemy seemed to wake up. But there was no mistake about it when they did. Seldom have I seen such a concentrated fire. Gun, pom-pom, machine-gun, and rifle blazed out from right to left along more than three miles of entrenchments. A continuous lightning-like line of fire poured forth from the British trenches which still lay in shadow. I could see the bullets raising perfect sandstorms in places, the little pom-pom shells sparkling about all over our prostrate men, and the shrapnel bursting all along their front, producing perfect swaths of white smoke which hung low down in the still air in the valley. But our artillery was not idle. The field guns, pushed well forward, showered shrapnel upon the British position, the howitzer shells hurtled over our heads on their way to the enemy in constantly increasing numbers as the ranges were verified by the trial shots, while a terrible and unceasing reverberation from the northeast told of the supporting attack made by the Ninth and Tenth Corps upon the blackened woods held by the English. The concussion of the terrific cannonade that now resounded from every quarter was deafening. The air seemed to pulse within one's ears, and it was difficult to hear one's nearest neighbor speak. Down in the valley our men appeared to be suffering severely. Every forward move of the attacking lines left a perfect litter of prostrate forms behind it, and for some time I felt very doubtful in my own mind if the attack would succeed. Glancing to the right, however, I was encouraged to see the progress that had been made by the troops detailed for the assault on Copt Hall and Obelisk Fort, and seeing this, it occurred to me that it was not intended to push the central attack on Epping home before its flank had been secured from molestation from this direction. Copt Hall itself stood out on a bare down, almost like some medieval castle, backed by the dark masses of forest, while to the west of it the slopes of Fort Obelisk could barely be distinguished, so flat were they, and so well screened by greenery. But its position was clearly defined by the clouds of dust, smoke, and debris constantly thrown up by our heavy high explosive shells, while ever and anon there came a dazzling flash from it, followed by a detonation that made itself heard even above the rolling of the cannonade, as one of its big 7.5 guns was discharged. The roar of their huge projectiles, too, as they tore through the air, was easily distinguishable. None of our impalments were proof against them, and they did our heavy batteries a great deal of damage before they could be silenced. To cut a long story short, we captured Epping after a tough fight, and by noon were in possession of everything north of the forest, including the war-scarred ruins that now represented the mansion of Copt Hall, and from which our pom-poms and machine-guns were firing into Fort Obelisk. But our losses had been awful. As for the enemy, they could hardly have suffered less severely for though partially protected by their entrenchments, our artillery fire must have been utterly annihilating. September 18. Fighting went on all last night, the English holding desperately on to the edge of the forest, our people pressing them close and working round their right flank. When day broke the general situation was pretty much like this. On our left the Ninth Corps were in possession of the fort at Took Hill, and a redoubt that lay between it and Skip's Fort. Two batteries were bombarding a redoubt lower down in the direction of Stanford Rivers, which was also subjected to a cross-fire from their howitzers near Ongar. As for the English, their position was an unenviable one. From Copt Hall, as soon as we have cleared the edge of the forest of the enemy's sharpshooters, we shall be able to take their entrenchments in reverse all the way to Waltham Abbey. They have, on the other hand, an outlying fort about a mile or two north of the latter place, which gave us some trouble with its heavy guns yesterday, and which it is most important that we should gain possession of before we advance further. The Guard Corps on the western side of the River Lee is now, I hear, 
in sight of the enemy's lines, and is keeping them busily employed, though without pushing its attack home for the present. At daybreak this morning I was in Epting, and saw the beginning of the attack on the forest. It is rumored that large reinforcements have reached the enemy from London, but as these must be merely scratch soldiers, they will do them more harm than good in their cramped position. The Tenth Corps had got a dozen batteries in position a little to the eastward of the village, and at six o'clock these guns opened a tremendous fire upon the northeast corner of the forest, under cover of which their infantry deployed down in the low ground about Coopersall and advanced to the attack. Petrol shells were not used against the forest, as von Kronhelm had given orders that it was not to be burned if it could possibly be avoided. The shrapnel was very successful in keeping down the fire from the edge of the trees, but our troops received a good deal of damage from infantry and guns that were posted to the east of the forest on a hill near Thaden Boy. But about seven o'clock these troops were driven from their position by a sudden flank attack made by the Ninth Corps from Thaden Mount. Von Kleppen followed this up by putting some of his own guns up there, which were able to fire on the edge of the forest after those of the Tenth Corps had been masked by the close advance of their infantry. To make a long story short, by ten the whole of the forest, east of the London Road, as far south as the crossroads near Jack's Hill, was in our hands. In the meantime, the Fourth Corps had made itself master of Fort Obelisk, and our gunners were hard at work mounting guns in it with which to fire on the outlying fort at Monkham's Hall. Von Kleppen was at Copt Hall about this time, and with him I found General von Vilberg commanding the Tenth Corps in close consultation. The once fine mansion had been almost completely shot away down to its lower story. A large portion of this, however, was still fairly intact, having been protected to a certain extent by the masses of masonry that had fallen around it, and also by the thick ramparts of earth that the English had built up against its exposed side. Our men were still firing from its loopholes at the edge of the woods, which were only about twelve hundred yards distant, and from which bullets were constantly whistling in by every window. Two of our battalions had dug themselves in in the wooden part surrounding the house, and were also exchanging fire with the English at comparatively close ranges. They had, I was told, made more than one attempt to rush the edge of the forest, but had been repulsed by rifle fire on each occasion. Away to the west I could see for miles, and even distinguish our shells bursting all over the enemy's fort at Monkham's Hall, which was being subjected to a heavy bombardment by our guns on the high ground to the north of it. About eleven, Frolick's cavalry brigade, whose presence was no longer required in front of the garden troops, passed through Epping, going southeast. It is generally supposed that it is either to attack the British at Brentwood in the rear, or, which I think is more probable, to intimidate the raw levies by its presence between them and London, and to attack them in flank should they attempt to retreat. Just after eleven another battalion arrived at Copt Hall from Epping, and orders were given that the English position along the edge of the forest was to be taken at all cost. Just before the attack began, there was a great deal of firing somewhere in the interior of the forest, presumably between the British and the advanced troops of the Tenth Corps. However this may have been, it was evident that the enemy were holding our part of the forest much less strongly, and our assault was entirely successful with but small loss of men. Once in the woods, the superior training and discipline of our men told heavily in their favor. While the mingled mass of volunteers and raw free shooters, of which the bulk of their garrison was composed, got utterly disorganized and out of hand under the severe strain on them that was imposed by the difficulties of wood fighting, and hindered and broke up the regular units, our people were easily kept well in hand and drove the enemy steadily before them without a single check. The rattle of rifle and machine gun was continuous through all the leafy dells and glades of the wood, but by two o'clock practically the whole forest was in the hands of our Tenth Corps. It was then the turn of the Fourth Corps, who in the meantime, far from being idle, had massed a large number of their guns at Copt Hall, from which, aided by the fire from Fort Obelisk, 
the enemy's lines were subjected to a bombardment that rendered them absolutely untenable, and we could see company after company making their way to Waltham Abbey. At three the order for a general advance on Waltham Abbey was issued. As the enemy seemed to have few, if any, guns at this place, it was determined to make use of some of the new armored motors that accompanied the army. Von Kronhelm, who was personally directing the operations from Copt Hall, had caused each corps to send its own motors to Epping, so that we had something like thirty at our disposal. These quaint gray monsters came down through the forest and advanced on Epping by two parallel roads, one passing by the south of Worley's Park, the other being the main road from Epping. It was a weird sight to see these shore-going armor-clads flying down upon the enemy. They got within eight hundred yards of the houses, but the enemy contrived to block their further advance by various obstacles which they placed on the roads. There was about an hour's desperate fighting in the village. The old abbey church was set on fire by a stray shell, the conflagration spreading to the neighboring houses, and both British and Germans being too busy killing each other to put it out, the whole village was shortly in flames. The British were finally driven out of it and across the river by five o'clock. In the meantime, every heavy gun that could be got to bear was directed on the fort at Monkham's Hall, which, during the afternoon, was also made the target for the guns of the Guard Corps, which cooperated with us by attacking the lines at Cheshunt and assisting us with its artillery fire from the opposite side of the river. By nightfall, the fort was a mass of smoking earth, over which fluttered our Black Cross flag, and the front of the Fourth Corps stretched from this to Gilwell Park, four miles nearer London. The Tenth Corps was in support in the forest behind us, and forming also a front to cover our flank, reaching from Chingford to Buckhurst Hill. The enemy was quite demoralized in this direction, and showed no indication of resuming the engagement. As for the Ninth Corps, its advanced troops were at Lambourne End, in close communication with General Furlick, who had established his headquarters at Habering, Abbey Bower. We have driven a formidable wedge right into the middle of the carefully elaborate system of defense arranged by the British generals, and it will now be a miracle if they can prevent our entry into the capital. We have not, of course, effected this without a great loss in killed and wounded, but you can't make puddings without breaking eggs, and in the end a bold and forward policy is more economical of life and limb than attempting to avoid necessary losses as our present opponents did in South Africa, thereby prolonging the war to an almost indefinite period and losing many more men by sickness and in driblets than would have been the case if they had followed a more determined line in their strategy and tactics. Just before the sun sank behind the masses of new houses which the monster city spreads out to the northward, I got orders to carry a dispatch to General von Vilberg, who was stated to be at Chingford on our extreme left. I went by the forest road, as the parallel one near the river was in most parts under fire from the opposite bank. He had established his headquarters at the Forester's Inn, which stands high up on a wooded mound, and from which he could see a considerable distance and keep in touch with his various signal stations. He took my dispatch, telling me that I should have a reply to take back later on. In the meantime, said he, if you will fall in with my staff, you will have an opportunity of seeing the first shots fired into the biggest city in the world. So saying, he went out to his horse, which was waiting outside, and we started off down the hill with a great clatter. After winding about through a somewhat intricate network of roads and by-lanes, we arrived at Old Chingford Church, which stands upon a species of headland, rising boldly up above the flat and, in some places, marshy land, to the westward. Close to the church was a battery of four big howitzers, the gunners grouped around them silhouetted darkly against the blood-red sky. From up here the vast city, spreading out to the south and west, lay like a gray, sprawling octopus, spreading out ray-like to the northward, every rise and ridge being topped with a bristle of spires and chimney-pots. An ominous silence seemed to brood over the teeming landscape, 
broken only at intervals by the dull booming of guns from the northward. Long swaths of cloud and smoke lay athwart the dull furnace-like glow of the sunset, and lights were beginning to sparkle out all over the vast expanse which lay before us mirrored here and there in the canals and rivers that ran almost at our feet. Now, said von Wilberg at length, commence fire. One of the big guns gave tongue with a roar that seemed to make the church tower quiver above us. Another and another followed in succession, their big projectiles hurtling and humming through the quiet evening air on their errands of death and destruction in I know not what quarter of the crowded suburbs. It seemed to me a cruel and needless thing to do, but I am told that it was done with the set purpose of arousing such a feeling of alarm and insecurity in the East End that the mob might try to interfere with any further measures for defense that the British military authorities might undertake. I got my dispatch soon afterwards and returned with it to the general who was spending the night at Copt Hall. There, too, I got myself a shakedown and slumbered soundly till the morning. September 19. Today we have, I think, finally broken down all organized military opposition in the field, though we may expect a considerable amount of street fighting before reaping the whole fruits of our victories. At daybreak we began by turning a heavy fire from every possible quarter on the wooded island formed by the river and various backwaters just north of Waltham Abbey. The poplar-clad islet, which was full of the enemy's troops, became absolutely untenable under this concentrated fire, and they were compelled to fall back over the river. Our engineers soon began their bridging operations behind the wood, and our infantry, crossing over, got close up to a redoubt on the further side and took it by storm. Again we were able to take a considerable section of the enemy's lines in reverse, and as they were driven out by our fire, against which they had no protection, the guard troops advanced and by ten were in possession of Cheshon. In the meanwhile, covered by the fire of the guns belonging to the Ninth and Tenth Corps, other bridges had been thrown across the Lee at various points between Waltham and Chingford, and in another hour the crossing began. The enemy had no good positions for his guns, and seemed to have very few of them. He had pinned his faith upon the big weapons he had placed in his entrenchments, and those were now of no further use to him. He had lost a number of his field guns, either from damage or capture, and with our more numerous artillery firing from the high ground on the eastern bank of the river, we were always able to beat down any attempt he made to reply to their fire. We had a day of fierce fighting before us. There was no maneuvering. We were in a wilderness of scattered houses and occasional streets, in which the enemy contested our progress foot by foot. Edmonton, Edenfield Walsh, and Waltham Cross were quickly captured. Our artillery commanded them too well to allow the British to make a successful defense. But Enfield itself, lying along a steepish ridge, on which the British had assembled what artillery they could scrape together, cost us dearly. The streets of this not-too-lovely suburban town literally ran with blood when at last we made our way into it. A large part of it was burnt to ashes, including, unfortunately, the ancient palace of Queen Elizabeth and the venerable and enormous cedar tree that overhung it. The British fell back to a second position that they had apparently prepared along a parallel ridge farther to the westward, their left being between us and New Barnett and their right at Southgate. We did not attempt to advance farther today, but contented ourselves in reorganizing our forces and preparing against a possible counterattack by barricading and entrenching the farther edge of Enfield Ridge. September 20. We are falling in immediately as it has been decided to attack the British position at once. Already the artillery duel is in progress. I must continue tonight, as my horse is at the door. The writer, however, never lived to complete his diary, having been shot halfway up the green slope he had observed the day before. End of chapter 3. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com.
Chapter Four of the Invasion by William LeCue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Four, Bombardment of London. Day broke. The faint flush of violet away eastward beyond Temple Bar gradually turned rose, heralding the sun's coming, and by degrees the streets, filled by excited Londoners, grew lighter with the dawn. Fevered night thus gave place to day, a day that was, alas, destined to be one of bitter memory for the British Empire. Alarming news had spread that Uhland had been seen reconnoitering in Snaresbrook and Wanstead, had ridden along Forest Road and Ferry Lane at Walthamstow through Tottenham High Cross, up High Street, Hornsby, Priory Road, and Muswell Hill. The Germans were actually upon London. The northern suburbs were staggered. In Fortis Green, North End, Highgate, Crouch End, Hampstead, Stamford Hill, and Leighton, the quiet suburban houses were threatened, and many people, in fear of their lives, had now fled southward into central London. Thus the huge population of Greater London was practically huddled together in the comparatively small area from Kensington to Fleet Street, and from Oxford Street to the Thames Embankment. People of Fulham, Putney, Wallham Green, Hammersmith, and Kew had, for the most part, fled away to the open country across Hounslow Heath to Bentham and Staines, while Tooting, Balham, Dulwich, Streatham, Norwood, and Catford had retreated farther south into Surrey and Kent. For the past three days thousands of willing helpers had followed the example of Sheffield and Birmingham and constructed enormous barricades obstructing at various points the chief roads leading from the north and east into London. Detachments of engineers had blown up several of the bridges carrying the main roads out eastwards, for instance the bridge at the end of Commercial Road east crossing the Limehouse Canal, while the six other small bridges spanning the canal between that point and the Bow Road were also destroyed. The bridge at the end of Bow Road itself was shattered, and those over the Hackney Cut at Marshall Hill and Hackney Wick were also rendered impassable. Most of the bridges across the Regent's Canal were also destroyed, notably those in Mare Street, Hackney, the Kingsland Road, and New North Road, while a similar demolition took place in Edgware Road and the Harrow Road. Londoners were frantic now that the enemy were really upon them. The accounts of the battles in the newspapers had, of course, been merely fragmentary, and they had not yet realized what war actually meant. They knew that all business was at a standstill, that the city was in an uproar, that there was no work, and that food was at famine prices. But not until German cavalry were actually seen scouring the northern suburbs did it become impressed upon them that they were really helpless and defenseless. London was to be besieged. This report having got about, the people began building barricades in many of the principal thoroughfares north of the Thames. One huge obstruction, built mostly of paving stones from the footways, overturned tramcars, wagons, railway trolleys, and barbed wire, rose in the Holloway Road just beyond Highbury Station. Another blocked the Caledonian Road a few miles north of the police station while another very large and strong pile of miscellaneous goods, bales of wool and cotton stuffs, building material, and stones brought from the great northern railway depot, obstructed the Camden Road at the south corner of Hilldrop Crescent. Across High Street, Camden Town, at the junction of the Kentish Town and other roads, five hundred men worked with a will, piling together every kind of ponderous object they could pillage from the neighboring shops, pianos, iron bedsteads, wardrobes, pieces of calico and flannel, dress stuffs, rolls of carpets, floorboards, even the very doors wrenched from their hinges, until when it reached to the second-story window and was considered of sufficient height, a pole was planted on top, and from it hung limply a small Union Jack. The Finchley Road, opposite Swiss Cottage Station, in Shoot-Up Hill where Mill Lane runs into it, across Willesden Lane where it joins the High Road in Kilburn, the Harrow Road close to Willistan Junction Station, at the junction of the Goldhawk and Uxbridge Roads, across the Hammersmith Road in front of the hospital 
other obstructions were placed with a view to preventing the enemy from entering London. At a hundred other points, in the narrower and more obscure thoroughfares, all along the north of London, busy workers were constructing similar defences, houses and shops being ruthlessly broken open and cleared of their contents by the frantic and terrified populace. London was in a ferment. Almost without exception the gunmakers' shops had been pillaged, and every rifle, sporting gun, and revolver seized. The armories at the Tower of London, at the various barracks, and the factory out at Enfield had long ago been cleared of their contents. For now, in this last stand, everyone was desperate, and all who could obtain a gun did so. Many, however, had guns but no ammunition. Others had sporting ammunition for service rifles, and others cartridges, but no gun. Those, however, who had guns and ammunition complete mounted guard at the barricades, being assisted at some points by volunteers who had been driven in from Essex. Upon more than one barricade in North London a maxim had been mounted, and was now pointed ready to sweep away the enemy should they advance. Other thoroughfares barricaded, besides those mentioned, were the Stroud Green Road, where it joins Hanley Road, the railway bridge in the Oakfield Road in the same neighborhood, the Whitefield Road opposite Harringay Station, the junction of Archway Road and Highgate Hill, the High Road Tottenham at its junction with West Green Road, and various roads around the New River Reservoirs, which were believed to be one of the objectives of the enemy. These latter were very strongly held by thousands of brave and patriotic citizens though the East London reservoirs across at Walthamstow could not be defended, situated so openly as they were. The people of Leytonstow threw up a barricade opposite the schools in the high road, while in Wanstead a hastily constructed but perfectly useful obstruction was piled across Cambridge Park, where it joins the Blake Road. Of course all the women and children in the northern suburbs had now been sent south. Half the houses in those quiet, newly built roads were locked up and their owners gone, for as soon as the report spread of the result of the final battle before London and our crushing defeat, people living in Highgate, Hampstead, Crouch End, Hornsby Tottenham, Finsbury Park, Muswell Hill, Hendon, and Hampstead saw that they must fly southward, now the Germans were upon them. Think what it meant to those suburban families of city men the ruthless destruction of their pretty long-cherished homes flight into the turbulent noisy distracted hungry city and the loss of everything they possessed in most cases the husband was already bearing his part in the defence of the metropolis with gun or with spade or helping to move heavy masses of material for the construction of the barricades the wife however was compelled to take a last look at all those possessions that she had so fondly called home lock her front door, and with her children join in those long mournful processions moving ever southward into London, tramping on and on, whither she knew not where. Touching sights were to be seen everywhere in the streets that day. Homeless women, many of them with two or three little ones, were wandering through the less frequented streets, avoiding the main roads with all their crush, excitement, and barricade building but making their way westward beyond Kensington and Hammersmith, which was now become the outlet of the metropolis. All trains from Charing Cross, Waterloo, London Bridge, Victoria, and Paddington had for the past three days been crowded to excess. Anxious fathers struggled fiercely to obtain places for their wives, mothers, and daughters, sending them away anywhere out of the city which must in a few hours be crushed beneath the iron heel. The southwestern and great western systems carried thousands upon thousands of the wealthier away to Devonshire and Cornwall, as far as possible from the theatre of war. The southeastern and Chatham took people into the already crowded Kentish towns and villages, and the Brighton line carried others into rural Sussex. London overflowed southward and westward, until every village and every town within fifty miles was so full that beds were at a premium, and in various places, notably at Chartham, near Canterbury, at Willsborough, near Ashford, at Lewes, at Robertsbridge, at Goodwood Park, and at Horsham, huge camps were formed, 
shelter being afforded by poles and rick cloths. Every house, every barn, every school, indeed every place where people could obtain shelter for the night, was crowded to access, mostly by women and children sent south, away from the horrors that it was known must come. Central London grew more turbulent with each hour that passed. There were all sorts of wild rumors, but fortunately the press still preserved a dignified calm. The cabinet were holding a meeting at Bristol, whither the House of Commons and Lords had moved, and all depended upon its issue. It was said that the ministers were divided in their opinions whether we should sue for an ignominious peace, or whether the conflict should be continued to the bitter end. Disaster had followed disaster, and iron-throated orators in Hyde and St. James's Park were now shouting, "'Stop the war! Stop the war!' The cry was taken up, but faintly, however, for the blood of Londoners, slow to rise, had now been stirred by seeing their country slowly yet completely crushed by Germany. All the patriotism latent within them was now displayed. The national flag was shown everywhere, and at every point one heard, God save the King, sung lustily. Two gunmaker's shops in the Strand, which had hitherto escaped notice, were shortly after noon broken open, and every available arm and all the ammunition seized. One man, unable to obtain a revolver, snatched half a dozen pairs of steel handcuffs, and cried with grim humor as he held them up, If I can't shoot any of the sausage-eaters, I can at least bag a prisoner or two. The banks, the great jewelers, the diamond merchants, the safe deposit offices, and all who had valuables in their keeping were extremely anxious as to what might happen. Below those dark buildings in Lothbury and Lombard Street, behind the black walls of the Bank of England, and below every branch bank all over London, were millions in golden notes, the wealth of the greatest city the world has ever known. The strong rooms were, for the most part, the strongest that modern engineering could devise, some with various arrangements by which all access was debarred by an inrush of water, but alas, dynamite is a great leveller, and it was felt that not a single strong room in the whole of London could withstand an organized attack by German engineers. A single charge of dynamite would certainly make a breach in concrete upon which a thief might hammer and chip day and night for a month without making much impression. Steel doors must give to blasting force, while the strongest and most complicated locks would also fly to pieces. The directors of most of the banks had met, and an endeavor had been made to cooperate and form a corps of special guards for the principal offices. In fact, a small armed corps was formed, and were on duty day and night in Lothbury, Lombard Street, and the vicinity. Yet what could they do if the Germans swept into London? There was but little to fear from the excited populace themselves, because matters had assumed such a crisis that money was of little use, as there was practically very little to buy. But little food was reaching London from the open ports on the west. It was the enemy that the banks feared, for they knew that the Germans intended to enter and sack the metropolis, just as they had sacked the other towns that had refused to pay the indemnity demanded. Small jewelers had, days ago, removed their stock from their windows and carried it away in unsuspicious-looking bags to safe hiding in the southern and western suburbs, where people for the most part hid their valuable plate, jewelry, etc., beneath a floorboard or buried them in some marked spot in their small gardens. The hospitals were already full of wounded from the various engagements of the past week. The London, St. Thomas, Charing Cross, St. George's, Guys and Bartholomews were overflowing, and the surgeons, with patriotic self-denial, were working day and night in an endeavor to cope with the ever-arriving crowd of suffering humanity. The field hospitals away to the northward were also reported full. The exact whereabouts of the enemy was not known. They were, it seemed, everywhere. They had practically overrun the whole country and the reports from the Midlands and the North showed that the majority of the principal towns had now been occupied. The latest reverses outside London, full and graphic details of which were now being published hourly by the papers, had created an immense sensation. Everywhere 
people were regretting that Lord Roberts' solemn warnings in 1906 had been unheeded, for had we adopted his scheme for universal service, such dire catastrophe could never have occurred. Many had, alas, declared it to be synonymous with conscription, which it certainly was not, and by that foolish argument had prevented the public at large from accepting it as the only means for our salvation as a nation. The repeated warnings had been disregarded, and we had unhappily lived in a fool's paradise in the self-satisfied belief that England could not be successfully invaded. Now, alas, the country had realized the truth when too late. That memorable day, September 20, witnessed exasperated struggles in the northern suburbs of London, passionate and bloody collisions, an infantry fire of the defenders overwhelming every attempted assault, and a decisive action of the artillery with regard to which arm the superiority of the Germans, due to their perfect training, was apparent. A last desperate stand had, it appears, been made by the defenders on the high ridge northwest of New Barnet, from Southgate to near Potter's Bar, where a terrible fight had taken place. But from the very first it was utterly hopeless. The British had fought valiantly in defense of London, but here again they were outnumbered, and after one of the most desperate conflicts in the whole campaign, in which our losses were terrible, the Germans at length had succeeded in entering Chipping Barnet. It was a difficult movement, and a fierce contest, rendered the more terrible by the burning houses, ensued in the streets and away across the low hills southward. A struggle full of vicissitudes and alternating successes, until at last the fire of the defenders was silenced, and hundreds of prisoners fell into the German hands. Thus the last organized defense of London had been broken, and the barricades alone remained. The work of the German troops on the lines of communications in Essex had for the past week been fraught with danger. Through one of cavalry the British had been unable to make cavalry raids, but, on the other hand, the difficulty was enhanced by the bands of sharpshooters, men of all classes from London, who possessed a gun and who could shoot. In one or two of the London clubs the suggestion had first been mooted a couple of days after the outbreak of hostilities and it had been quickly taken up by men who were in the habit of shooting game, but had not had a military training. Within three days about two thousand men had formed themselves into bands to take part in the struggle and assist in the defense of London. They were practically similar to the front tireurs of the Franco-German War, for they went forth in companies and waged a guerrilla warfare, partly before the front and at the flanks of the different armies, and partly at the communications at the rear of the Germans. Their position was one of constant peril in face of von Kronhelm's proclamation, yet the work they did was excellent, and only proved that if Lord Robert's scheme for universal training had been adopted, the enemy would never have reached the gates of London with success. These brave adventurous spirits, together with the legion of frontiersmen, made their attacks by surprise from hiding-places or from ambushes. Their adventures were constantly thrilling ones. Scattered all over the theatre of war in Essex and Suffolk, and all along the German lines of communication, the frontiersmen rarely ventured on an open conflict, and frequently changed scene and point of attack. Within one week their numbers rose to over eight thousand and, being well served by the villagers, who acted as scouts and spies for them, the Germans found them very difficult to get at. Usually they kept their arms concealed in thickets and woods, where they would lie in wait for the Germans. They never came to close quarters, but fired at a distance. Many a smart Ulan fell by their bullets, and many a sentry dropped, shot by an unknown hand. Thus they harassed the enemy everywhere. At need they concealed their arms and assumed the appearance of inoffensive non-combatants, but when caught red-handed the Germans gave them short shrift, as the bodies now swinging from the telegraph poles on various high roads in Essex testified. In an attempt to put a stop to the daring actions of the frontiersmen, the German authorities and troops along the lines of communication punished the parishes where German soldiers were shot or where the destruction of railways and telegraphs had occurred by levying money contributions 
or by burning the villages. The guerrilla war was especially fierce along from Edgware up to Hertford and from Chelmsford down to the Thames. In fact, once commenced, it never ceased. Attacks were always being made upon small patrols, traveling detachments, mails of the field post service, posts or patrols at stations on the lines of communication, while field telegraphs, telephones, and railways were everywhere destroyed. In consequence of the railway being cut at Pitsey, the villages of Pitsey, Bowers Gifford, and Vange had been burned. Because a German patrol had been attacked and destroyed near Orsett, the parish was compelled to pay a heavy indemnity. Upminster, near Romford, Thayton Boy, and Fifield, near High Ongar, had all been burned by the Germans for the same reason, while at the Cherry Tree Inn, near Raynham, five frontiersmen being discovered by Uhlans in a hayloft asleep, were locked in and there burned alive. Dozens were, of course, shot at sight, and dozens more hanged without trial, but they were not to be deterred. They were fighting in defense of London, and around the northern suburbs the patriotic members of the Legion were specially active, though they never showed themselves in large bands. Within London every man who could shoot game was now anxious to join in the fray, and on the day that the news of the last disaster reached the metropolis, hundreds left for the open country out beyond Hendon. The enemy, having broken down the defense at Enfield and cleared the defenders out of the fortified houses, had advanced and occupied the northern ridges of London in a line stretching roughly from Pole Hill, a little to the north of Chingford, across Upper Edmonton, through Tottingham, Hornsby, Highgate, Hampstead, and Willesden, to Twyford Abbey. All the positions had been well reconnoitred, for at grey of dawn the rumbling of artillery had been heard in the streets of those places already mentioned, and soon after sunrise strong batteries were established upon all the available points commanding London. These were at Chingford Green, on the left-hand side of the road opposite the inn at Chingford, on Devonshire Hill, Tottingham, on the hill at Wood Green, in the grounds of Alexandra Palace, on the high ground about Churchyard Bottom Wood, on the edge of Bishop's Wood, Highgate, on Parliament Hill at a spot close to the Oaks on the Hendon Road, at Dallas Hill, and at a point a little north of Wormwood Scrubs, and at Neesden near the railway works. The enemy's chief object was to establish their artillery as near London as possible, for it was known that the range of their guns even from Hampstead, the highest point, 441 feet above London, would not reach into the actual city itself. Meanwhile, at dawn, the German cavalry, infantry, motor infantry, and armored motor cars, the latter mostly thirty-five to forty horsepower Opel Duracs, with three quick-firing guns mounted in each, and bearing the imperial German arms in black, advanced up the various roads leading into London from the north, being met, of course, with a desperate resistance at the barricades. On Haverstock Hill the three Maxims, mounted upon the huge construction across the road, played havoc with the Germans, who were at once compelled to fall back, leaving piles of dead and dying in the roadway, where the terrible hail of lead poured out upon the invaders could not be withstood. Two of the German armored motor cars were presently brought into action by the Germans, who replied with a rapid fire, this being continued for a full quarter of an hour without result on either side. Then the Germans, finding the defense too strong, again retired into Hampstead, amid the ringing cheers of the valiant men holding that gate of London. The losses of the enemy had been serious, for the whole roadway was now strewn with dead, while beyond the huge wall of paving stones overturned carts and furniture, only two men had been killed and one wounded. Across in Finchley Road a struggle equally as fierce was in progress but a detachment of the enemy, evidently led by some German who had knowledge of the intricate side roads, suddenly appeared in the rear of the barricade, and a fierce and bloody hand-to-hand -hand conflict ensued. The defenders, however, stood their ground, and with the aid of some petrol bombs which they held in readiness, they destroyed the venturesome detachment almost to a man, though a number of houses in the vicinity were set on fire, causing a huge conflagration. In Highgate Road the attack was a desperate one, the enraged Londoners fighting valiantly, 
the men with arms being assisted by the populace themselves. Here again deadly petrol bombs had been distributed, and men and women hurled them against the Germans. Petrol was actually poured from windows upon the heads of the enemy, and toe soaked in paraffin and lit flung in among them, when in an instant whole areas of the streets were ablaze, and the soldiers of the fatherland perished in the roaring flames. Every device to drive back the invader was tried. Though thousands upon thousands had left the northern suburbs, many thousands still remained bent on defending their homes as long as they had breath. The crackle of rifles was incessant, and ever and anon the dull roar of a heavy field gun and the sharp rattle of a maxim mingled with the cheers, yells, and shrieks of victors and vanquished. The scene on every side was awful. Men were fighting for their lives in desperation. Around the barricade in Holloway Road the street ran with blood, while in Kingsland, in Clapton, in Westham, and Canning Town the enemy were making an equally desperate attack and were being repulsed everywhere. London's enraged millions, the Germans were well aware, constituted a grave danger. Any detachments who carried a barricade by assault, as, for instance, they did one in the Hornsby Road near the station, were quickly set upon by the angry mob and simply wiped out of existence. Until nearly noon, desperate conflicts at the barricades continued. The defense was even more effectual than was expected. Yet, had it not been that von Kronhelm, the German generalissimo, had given orders that the troops were not to attempt to advance into London before the populace were cowed, there was no doubt that each barricade could have been taken in the rear by companies avoiding the main roads and proceeding by the side streets. Just before noon, however, it was apparent to von Kronhelm that to storm the barricades would entail enormous losses, so strong were they. The men holding them had now been reinforced in many cases by regular troops who had come in to fight, and a good many guns were now manned by artillerymen. Von Kronhelm had established his headquarters at Jack Straw Castle, from which he could survey the giant city through his field glasses. Below lay the great plain of roofs, spires, and domes, stretching away into the gray mystic distance, where afar rose the twin towers and double arches of the Crystal Palace roof. London, the great London, the capital of the world, lay at his mercy at his feet. The tall, thin-faced general, with the grizzled mustache and the glittering cross at his throat, standing apart from his staff, gazed away in silence and in thought. It was his first sight of London, and its gigantic proportions amazed even him. Again he swept the horizon with his glass, and knit his grey brows. He remembered the parting words of his emperor as he backed out of that plainly furnished little private cabinet at Potsdam. You must bombard London and sack it. The pride of those English must be broken at all costs. Go, Kronhelm, go, and may the best of fortune go with you. The sun was at the noon causing the glass roof of the distant crystal palace to gleam. Far down in the grey hay stood Big Ben, the Campanile, and a thousand church spires, all tiny and, from that distance, insignificant. From where he stood the sound of crackling fire at the barricades reached him, and a little behind him a member of his staff was kneeling on the grass with his ear bent to the field telephone. Reports were coming in fast of the desperate resistance in the streets, and these were duly handed to him. He glanced at them, gave a final look at the outstretched city that was the metropolis of the world, and then gave rapid orders for the withdrawal of the troops from the assault of the barricades and the bombardment of London. In a moment the field telegraphs were clicking, the telephone bell was ringing, orders were shouted in German in all directions, and next second, with a deafening roar, one of the howitzers of the battery in the close vicinity to him gave tongue and threw its deadly shell somewhere into St. John's Wood. The reign of death had opened. London was surrounded by a semicircle of fire. The great gun was followed by a hundred others as, at all the batteries among the northern heights, the orders were received. Then, in a few minutes, from the whole line from Chingford to Willesden, roughly about twelve miles, came a hail of the most deadly of modern projectiles directed upon the most populous parts of the metropolis.'
though the Germans trained their guns to carry as far as was possible, the zone of fire did not at first, it seemed, extend further south than a line roughly taken from Notting Hill through Bayswater, past Paddington Station, along the Marleyburn and Euston roads, then up to Highbury, Stoke Newington, Stamford Hill, and Walthamstow. When, however, the great shells began to burst in Holloway, Kentish Town, Camden Town, Kilburn, Kensal Green, and other places lying within the area under fire, a frightful panic ensued. Whole streets were shattered by explosions, and fires were breaking out, the dark clouds of smoke obscuring the sunlit sky. Roaring flames shot up everywhere. Unfortunate men, women, and children were being blown to atoms by the awful projectiles, while others, distracted, sought shelter in any cellar or underground place they could find, while their houses fell about them like packs of cards. The scenes within that zone of terror were indescribable. When Paris had been bombarded years ago, artillery was not at the perfection it now was, and there had been no such high explosive known as in the present day. The great shells that were falling everywhere on bursting filled the air with poisonous fumes as well as with deadly fragments. One bursting in a street would wreck the rows of houses on either side and tear a great hole in the ground at the same moment. The fronts of the houses were torn out like paper, the iron railings twisted as though they were wire, and paving stones hurled into the air like straws. Anything and everything offering a mark to the enemy's guns was shattered. St. John's Wood and the houses about Regent's Park suffered seriously. A shell from Hampstead, falling into the roof of one of the houses near the center of Sussex Place, burst and shattered nearly all the houses in the row, while another fell in Cumberland Terrace and wrecked a dozen houses in the vicinity. In both cases the houses were mostly empty, for owners and servants had fled southward across the river as soon as it became apparent that the Germans actually intended to bombard. At many parts it made a veil, shells burst with appalling effect. Several of the houses in Elgin Avenue had their fronts torn out, and in one, a block of flats, there was considerable loss of life in the fire that broke out, escape being cut off, owing to the stairs having been demolished by the explosion. Abbey Road, St. John's Wood Road, Acacia Road and Wellington Road were quickly wrecked. In Chalk Farm Road, near the Adelaide, a terrified woman was dashing across the street to seek shelter with a neighbor when a shell burst right in front of her, blowing her to fragments, while in the early stage of the bombardment a shell bursting in the Midland Hotel at St. Pacras caused a fire which in half an hour resulted in the whole hotel and railway terminus being a veritable furnace of flame. Through the roof of King's Cross Station several shells fell and burst close to the departure platform. The whole glass roof was shattered, but beyond that little other material damage resulted. Shots were now falling everywhere, and Londoners were staggered. In dense excited crowds they were flying southwards towards the Thames. Some were caught in the streets in their flight, and were flung down, maimed and dying. The most awful sights were to be witnessed in the open streets men and women blown out of recognition, with their clothes singed and torn to shreds, and helpless innocent children lying white and dead, their limbs torn away and missing. Euston Station had shared the same fate as St. Pancras, and was blazing furiously, sending up a great column of black smoke that could be seen by all London. So many were the conflagrations now breaking out, that it seemed as though the enemy were sending into London shells filled with petrol in order to set the streets aflame. This, indeed, was proved by an eyewitness, who saw a shell fall in Liverpool Road close to the Angel. It burst with a bright red flash, and next second the whole of the roadway and neighboring houses were blazing furiously. Thus the air became black with smoke and dust, and the light of day obscured in northern London and through that obscurity came those whizzing shells in an incessant hissing stream, each one bursting in these narrow, thickly populated streets, causing havoc indescribable and a loss of life impossible to accurately calculate. Hundreds of people were blown to pieces in the open, but hundreds more were buried beneath the debris of their own cherished homes, now being so ruthlessly destroyed and demolished. On every side was heard the cry, 
Stop the war! Stop the war! But it was, alas, too late. Too late. Never in the history of the civilized world were there such scenes of reckless slaughter of the innocent and peace-loving as on that never-to-be-forgotten day when von Kronhelm carried out the orders of his imperial master and struck terror into the heart of London's millions. End of chapter 4 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapter Five of the Invasion by William Lequeu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Five, The Reign of Death. Through the whole afternoon, the heavy German artillery roared, belching forth their fiery vengeance upon London. Hour after hour they pounded away, until Saint Pancras Church was a heap of ruins and the founding hospital a veritable furnace, as well as the parcel post offices and the University College in Gower Street. In Hampstead Road many of the shops were shattered, and in Tottenham Court Road both Maples and Schoolbreds suffered severely, for shells bursting in the center of the roadway had smashed every pane of glass in the fronts of both buildings. The quiet squares of Bloomsbury were in some cases great yawning ruins, houses with their fronts torn out revealing the shattered furniture within. Streets were indeed filled with tiles, chimney-pots, fallen telegraph wires, and debris of furniture, stone steps, paving stones, and fallen masonry. Many of the thoroughfares, such as the Pentonville Road, Copenhagen Street, and Holloway Road were, at points, quite impassable on account of the ruins that blocked them. Into the northern hospital in the Holloway Road a shell fell, shattering one of the wards, and killing or maiming every one of the patients in the ward in question, while the church in Tufnell Park Road was burning fiercely. Upper Holloway, Stoke Newington, Highbury, Kingsland, Dalston, Hackney, Clapton, and Stamford Hill were being swept at long range by the guns on Muswell Hill and Churchyard Bottom Hill, and the terror caused in those densely populated districts was awful. Hundreds upon hundreds lost their lives, or else had a hand, an arm, a leg blown away as those fatal shells fell in never-ceasing monotony, especially in Stoke Newington and Kingsland. The many side roads lying between Holloway Road and Finsbury Park, such as Hornsbury Road, Tullington Park, Andover, Durham, Palmerston, Campbell, and Fort Hill Roads, Seven Sisters Road, and Eildon Road were all devastated for the guns for a full hour seemed to be trained upon them. The German gunners, in all probability, neither knew nor cared where their shells fell. From their position, now that the smoke of the hundreds of fires was now rising, they could probably discern but little. Therefore the batteries at Hampstead Heath, Muswell Hill, Wood Green, Cricklewood, and other places simply sent their shells as far distant south as possible into the panic-stricken city below. In Mount Grove and Riversdale Roads, Highbury Vale, a number of people were killed, while a frightful disaster occurred in the church at the corner of Park Lane and Milton Road, Stoke Newington. Here a number of people had entered, attending a special service for the success of the British arms, when a shell exploded on the roof, bringing it down upon them, and killing over fifty of the congregation, mostly women. The air, poisoned by the fumes of the deadly explosives, and full of smoke from the burning buildings, was ever and anon rent by explosions, as projectiles frequently burst in mid-air. The distant roar was incessant, like the noise of thunder, while on every hand could be heard the shrieks of defenseless women and children, or the muttered curses of some man who saw his home and all he possessed swept away with a flash and a cloud of dust. Nothing could withstand that awful cannonade. Walthamstow had been rendered untenable in the first half-hour of the bombardment, while in Tottenham the loss of life had been very enormous, the German gunners at Wood Green having apparently turned their first attention upon that place. Churches, the larger buildings, the railway station, in fact anything offering a mark, was promptly shattered, 
being assisted by the converging fire from the batteries at Chingford. On the opposite side of London, Notting Hill, Shepherd's Bush, and Starch Green were being reduced to ruins by the heavy batteries above Park Royal Station, which, firing across Wormwood Scrubs, put their shots into Notting Hill, and especially into Holland Park, where widespread damage was quickly wrought. A couple of shells falling into the generating station of the Central London Railway, or Tube, as Londoners usually call it, unfortunately caused a disaster and loss of life which were appalling. At the first sign of the bombardment, many thousands of people descended into the Tube as a safe hiding place from the rain of shell. At first the railway officials closed the doors to prevent the inrush, but the terrified populace in Shepherd's Bush, Bayswater, Oxford Street and Holborn, in fact all along the subterranean line, broke open the doors, and descending by the lifts and stairs found themselves in a place which at least gave them security against the enemy's fire. The trains had long ago ceased running, and every station was crowded to excess, while many were forced upon the line itself and actually into the tunnels. For hours they waited there in eager breathlessness, longing to be able to ascend and find the conflict over. Men and women in all stations of life were huddled together, while children clung to their parents in wonder. Yet as hour after hour went by, the report from above was still the same. The Germans had not ceased. Of a sudden, however, the light failed. The electric current had been cut off by the explosion of the shells in the generating station at Shepherd's Bush, and the lifts were useless. The thousands who, in defiance of the orders of the company, had gone below at Shepherd's Bush for shelter, found themselves caught like rats in a hole. True, there was the faint glimmer of an oil light here and there, but alas, that did not prevent an awful panic. Somebody shouted that the Germans were above and had put out the lights, and when it was found that the lifts were useless, a panic ensued that was indescribable. The people could not ascend the stairs, as they were blocked by the dense crowd, therefore they pressed into the narrow semicircular tunnels in an eager endeavor to reach the next station where they hoped they might escape. But once in there, women and children were quickly crushed to death, or thrown down and trampled upon by the press behind. In the darkness they fought with each other, pressing on and becoming jammed so tightly that many were held against the sloping walls until life was extinct. Between Shepherd's Bush and Holland Park stations the loss of life was worse, for being within the zone of the German fire the people had crushed in frantically in thousands, and with one accord a move had unfortunately been made into the tunnels on account of the foolish cry that the German were waiting above. The railway officials were powerless. They had done their best to prevent anyone going below, but the public had insisted, therefore no blame could be laid upon them for the catastrophe. At Marble Arch, Oxford Circus, and Tottenham Court Road stations a similar scene was enacted, and dozens upon dozens, alas, lost their lives in the panic. Ladies and gentlemen from Park Lane, Grosvenor Square, and Mayfair had sought shelter at the Marble Arch station, rubbing shoulders with laborers' wives and coster women from the back streets of Marleborne. When the lights failed, a rush had been made into the tunnel to reach Oxford Circus, all exit by the stairs being blocked, as at Shepherd's Bush, on account of the hundreds struggling to get down. As at Holland Park, the terrified crowd fighting with each other became jammed and suffocated in the narrow space. The catastrophe was a frightful one, for it was afterwards proved that over four hundred and twenty persons mostly weak women and children, lost their lives in those twenty minutes of darkness before the mains at the generating station, wrecked by the explosions, could be repaired. Then, when the current came up again, the lights revealed the frightful mishap, and people struggled to emerge from the burrows wherein they had so narrowly escaped death. Upon the Baker Street and Waterloo and other tubes every station had also been besieged. The whole of the first-mentioned line from north to south was a refuge of thousands who saw in it a safe place for retreat. The tunnels of the district railway, too, were filled with terror-stricken multitudes who descended at every station and walked away into a subterranean place of safety. No trains had been running for several days, therefore there was no danger from that cause. Meanwhile the bombardment continued with unceasing activity.' 
the Marlborne Station of the Great Central Railway and the Great Central Hotel, which seemed to be only just within the line of fire, were wrecked, and about four o'clock it was seen that the hotel, like that at St. Pancras, was well alight, though no effort could be made to save it. At the first two or three alarms of fire the Metropolitan Fire Brigade had turned out, but now that fresh alarms were reaching the chief station every moment, the brigade saw themselves utterly powerless to even attempt to save the hundred buildings, great and small, now furiously blazing. Gasometers, especially those of the Gaslight and Coke Company at Kensal Green, were marked by the German gunners, who sent them into the air, while a well-directed petrol bomb at Wormwood Scrubs Prison set one great wing of the place alight, and the prisoners were therefore released. The rear of Kensington Palace and the fronts of a number of houses in Kensington Palace Gardens were badly damaged, while in the dome of the Albert Hall was a great ugly hole. Shortly after five o'clock occurred a disaster which was of national consequence. It could only have been a mishap on the part of the Germans, for they would certainly never have done such irreparable damage willingly as they destroyed what would otherwise have been most valuable of loot. Shots suddenly began to fall fast in Bloomsbury, several of them badly damaging the Hotel Russell and the houses near, and it was therefore apparent that one of the batteries which had been firing from near Jack Straw's castle had been moved across to Parliament Hill, or even to some point south of it, which gave a wider range to the fire. Presently a shell came high through the air and fell full upon the British Museum, striking it nearly in the center of the front and in exploding carried away the Grecian Ionic ornament and shattered a number of the fine stone columns of the dark façade. Ere people in the vicinity had realized that the national collection of antiques was within range of the enemy's destructive projectiles, a second shell crashed into the rear of the building, making a great gap in the walls. Then, as though all the guns of that particular battery had converged in order to destroy our treasure house of art and antiquity, shell after shell crashed into the place in rapid succession. Before ten minutes had passed, gray smoke began to roll out from beneath the long colonnade in front, and growing denser told its own tale. The British Museum was on fire. Nor was that all. As though to complete the disaster, although it was certain that the Germans were in ignorance, there came one of those terrible shells filled with petrol which, bursting inside the manuscript room, set the whole place ablaze. In a dozen different places the building seemed to be now alight, especially the library, and thus the finest collection of books, manuscripts, Greek and Roman and Egyptian antiques, coins, medals, and prehistoric relics, lay at the mercy of the flames. The fire brigade was at once alarmed, and at imminent risk of their lives, for shells were still falling in the vicinity, they, with the salvage corps and the assistance of many willing helpers, some of whom unfortunately lost their lives in the flames, saved whatever could be saved, throwing the objects out into the railed-off quadrangle in front. The left wing of the museum, however, could not be entered, although, after most valiant efforts on the part of the firemen, the conflagrations that had broken out in other parts of the building were at length subdued. The damage was, however, irreparable, for many unique collections, including all the prints and drawings, and many of the medieval and historic manuscripts had already been consumed. Shots now began to fall as far south as Oxford Street, and all along that thoroughfare from Holborn as far as Oxford Circus, widespread havoc was being wrought. People fled for their lives back towards Charing Cross and the Strand. The Oxford Music Hall was a hopeless ruin while a shell crashing through the roof of Frascati's restaurant carried away a portion of the gallery and utterly wrecked the whole place. Many of the shops in Oxford Street had their roofs damaged or their fronts blown out, while a huge block of flats in Great Russell Street was practically demolished by three shells striking in rapid succession. Then, to the alarm of all who realized it, shots were seen to be passing high over Bloomsbury, south towards the Thames. The range had been increased, or, as was afterwards known, some heavier guns had now been mounted upon Muswell Hill and Hampstead Heath, which, carrying to a distance of from six to seven miles, placed the city, the Strand, and Westminster within the zone of fire. 
the zone in question stretched roughly from Victoria Park, through Bethnal Green and Whitechapel, across to Southwark, the Borough, Lambeth, and Westminster to Kensington, and while the fire upon the northern suburbs slackened, great shells now came flying through the air into the very heart of London. The German gunners at Muswell Hill took the dome of St. Paul's as a mark, for shells fell constantly in Ludgate Hill, in Cheapside, in Newgate Street, and in the churchyard itself. One falling upon the steps of the cathedral tore out two of the columns of the front, while another, striking the clock tower just below the face, brought down much of the masonry and one of the huge bells with a deafening crash, blocking the road with debris. Time after time the great shells went over the splendid cathedral, which the enemy seemed bent upon destroying, but the dome remained uninjured, though about ten feet of the top of the second tower was carried away. On the Cannon Street side of St. Paul's, a great block of drapery warehouses had caught fire and was burning fiercely, while the drapers and other shops on the Paternoster Road side all had their windows shattered by the constant detonations. Within the cathedral two shells that had fallen through the roof had wrought havoc with the beautiful reredos and the choir stalls, many of the fine windows being also wrecked by the explosions. Whole rows of houses in Cheapside suffered while both the mansion house where the London flag was flying and the Royal Exchange were severely damaged by a number of shells which fell in the vicinity. The equestrian statue in front of the exchange had been overturned, while the exchange itself showed a great yawning hole in the corner of the façade near Cornhill. At the Bank of England a fire had occurred, but had fortunately been extinguished by the strong force of guards in charge, though they gallantly risked their lives in so doing. Lothbury, Gresham Street, Old Broad Street, Lombard Street, Gracechurch Street, and Leadenhall Street were all more or less scenes of fire, havoc, and destruction. The loss of life was not great in this neighborhood, for most people had crossed the river or gone westward, but the high explosives used by the Germans were falling upon shops and warehouses with appalling effect. Masonry was torn about like paper, ironwork twisted like wax, woodwork shattered to a thousand splinters as time after time a great projectile hissed in the air and effected its errand of destruction a number of the wharves on each side of the river were soon alight and both upper and lower thames streets were soon impassable on account of huge conflagrations a few shells fell in shoreditch houndsditch and whitechapel and these in most cases caused loss of life in those densely populated districts Westward, however, as the hours went on, the howitzers at Hampstead began to drop high-explosive shells into the strand around Charing Cross and in Westminster. This weapon had a caliber of 4.14 inches and threw a projectile of 35 pounds. The tower of St. Clement Dane's Church crashed to the ground and blocked the roadway opposite Milford Lane. The pointed roof of the clock tower of the law courts was blown away and the granite fronts of the two banks opposite the law court's entrance were torn out by a shell which exploded in the footpath before them. Shells fell time after time, in and about the law courts themselves, committing immense damage to the interior, while the shell bursting upon the roof of Charing Cross Station rendered it a ruin as picturesque as it had been in December 1905. The National Liberal Club was burning furiously, the Hotel Cecil and the Savoy did not escape, but no material damage was done to them. The Garrick Theatre had caught fire, a shot carried away the globe above the Coliseum, and the shot tower beside the Thames crashed into the river. The front of the Grand Hotel in Trafalgar Square showed, in several places, great holes where the shell had struck, and a shell bursting at the foot of Nelson's Monument turned over one of the lions, overthrowing the emblem of Britain's might. The clubs in Pall Mall were, in one or two instances, wrecked, notably the Reform, the Junior Carlton, and the Athenium, into each of which shells fell through the roof and exploded within. From the number of projectiles that fell in the vicinity of the Houses of Parliament, it was apparent that the German gunners could see the Royal Standard flying from the Victoria Tower, and were making it their mark. In the west front of Westminster Abbey several shots crashed, doing enormous damage to the grand old pile. The hospital opposite was set alight, while the Westminster Palace Hotel was severely damaged, and two shells falling into St. Thomas's Hospital 
created a scene of indescribable terror in one of the overcrowded casualty wards. Suddenly one of the German high-explosive shells burst on top of the Victoria Tower, blowing away all four of the pinnacles and bringing down the flagstaff. Big Ben served as another mark for the artillery at Muswell Hill, and several shots struck it, tearing out one of the huge clock faces and blowing away the pointed apex of the tower. Suddenly, however, two great shells struck it right in the center, almost simultaneously near the base, and made such a hole in the huge pile of masonry that it was soon seen to have been rendered unsafe, though it did not fall. Shot after shot struck other portions of the Houses of Parliament, breaking the windows and carrying away pinnacles. One of the twin towers of Westminster Abbey fell a few moments later, and another shell crashing into the choir completely wrecked Edward the Confessor's shrine, the coronation chair, and all the objects of antiquity in the vicinity. The old horse guards escaped injury, but one of the cupolas of the new war office opposite was blown away, while shortly afterwards a fire broke out in the new local government building and education offices. Number 10 Downing Street, the chief center of the government, had its windows all blown in, a grim accident, no doubt, the same explosion shattering several windows in the foreign office. Many shells fell in St. James's and Hyde Parks, exploding harmlessly, but others, passing across St. James's Park, crashed into that high building Queen Anne's mansions, causing fearful havoc. Somerset House, Covent Garden Market, Drury Lane Theatre, and the Gaiety Theatre and Restaurant all suffered more or less, and two of the bronze foot guards guarding the Wellington statue at Hyde Park Corner were blown many yards away. Around Holborn Circus immense damage was being caused, and several shells bursting on the viaduct itself blew great holes in the bridge. So widespread indeed was the havoc that it is impossible to give a detailed account of the day's terrors. If the public building suffered, the damage to property of householders and the ruthless wrecking of quiet English homes may well be imagined. The people had been driven out from the zone of fire and had left their possessions to the mercy of the invaders. South of the Thames very little damage was done. The German howitzers and long-range guns could not reach so far. One or two shots fell in York Road, Lambeth, and in the Waterloo and Westminster Bridge roads, but they did little damage beyond breaking all the windows in the vicinity. When would it end? Where would it end? Half the population of London had fled across the bridges, and from Denmark Hill, Champion Hill, Norwood, and the Crystal Palace they could see the smoke issuing from the hundred fires. London was cowed. These northern barricades, still held by bodies of valiant men, were making a last desperate stand, though the streets ran with blood. Every man fought well and bravely for his country, though he went to his death. A thousand acts of gallant heroism on the part of Englishmen were done that day, but alas, all to no purpose. The Germans were at our gates and were not to be denied. As daylight commenced to fade, the dust and smoke became suffocating and yet the guns pounded away with a monotonous regularity that appalled the helpless populace. Overhead there was a quick whizzing in the air, a deafening explosion, and as the masonry came crashing down the atmosphere was filled with poisonous fumes that half asphyxiated all those in the vicinity. Hitherto the enemy had treated us on the whole humanely, but finding that desperate resistance in the northern suburbs, von Kronhelm was carrying out the Emperor's parting injunction. He was breaking the pride of our own dear London, even at the sacrifice of thousands of innocent lives. The scenes in the streets within that zone of awful fire baffled description. They were too sudden, too dramatic, too appalling. Death and destruction were everywhere, and the people of London now realized for the first time what the horrors of war really meant. Dusk was falling. Above the pall of smoke from burning buildings the sun was setting with a blood-red light. From the London streets, however, this evening sky was darkened by the clouds of smoke and dust. Yet the cannonade continued, each shell that came hurtling through the air, exploding with deadly effect and spreading destruction on all hands. Meanwhile 
the barricades at the north had not escaped von Kronhelm's attention. About four o'clock he gave orders by field telegraph for certain batteries to move down and attack them. This was done soon after five o'clock, and when the German guns began to pour their deadly rain of shell into those hastily improvised defenses, there commenced a slaughter of the gallant defenders that was horrible. At each of the barricades shell after shell was directed, and very quickly breaches were made. Thereupon the defenders themselves the fire was directed, a withering, awful fire from quick-firing guns which none could withstand. The streets, with their barricades swept away, were strewn with mutilated corpses. Hundreds upon hundreds had attempted to make a last stand, rallied by the Union Jack they waved above, but a shell exploding in their midst had sent them to instant eternity. Many a gallant deed was done that day by patriotic Londoners in defense of their homes and loved ones, many a deed that should have earned the V.C., but in nearly all cases the patriot who had stood up and faced the foe had gone to straight and certain death. Till seven o'clock the dull roar of the guns in the north continued, and people across the Thames knew that London was still being destroyed, nay, pulverized. Then with an accord came a silence, the first silence since the hot noon. Von Kronhelm's field telegraph at Jack Straw Castle had ticked the order to cease firing. All the barricades had been broken. London lay burning at the mercy of the German eagle. And as the darkness fell, the German commander-in-chief looked again through his glasses and saw the red flames leaping up in dozens of places where whole blocks of shops and buildings, public institutions, whole streets in some cases, were being consumed. London, the proud capital of the world, the home of the Englishman, was at last ground beneath the iron heel of Germany. And all, alas, due to one cause alone, the careless insular apathy of the Englishman himself. End of chapter 5 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapter six of the Invasion by William Lequeux. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter six Fall of London. Outside London, the September night had settled down on the blood stained field of battle. With a pale light, the moon had risen, partly hidden by chasing clouds, her white rays mingling with the lurid glare of the fires down in the great terrified metropolis below. Northward from Hampstead across the Barnet, indeed over that wide district where the final battle had been so hotly fought, the moonbeams shone upon the pallid faces of the fallen. Along the German line of investment there had now followed upon the roar of battle an uncanny silence. Away to the west, however, there was still heard the growling of distant conflict, now mounting into a low crackling of musketry fire, and again dying away in muffled sounds. The last remnant of the British army was being hotly pursued in the direction of Staines. London was invested and bombarded, but not yet taken. For a long time the general field marshal had stood alone upon Hampstead Heath, apart from his staff, watching the great tongues of flame leaping up here and there in the distant darkness. His gray shaggy brows were contracted, his thin aquiline face thoughtful, his hard mouth twitching nervously, unable to fully conceal the strain of his own feelings as conqueror of the English. Von Kronhelm's taciturnity had long ago been proverbial. The Kaiser had likened him to Malka, and had declared that he could be silent in seven languages. His gaze was one of musing, and yet he was the most active of men, and perhaps the cleverest strategist in all Europe. Often during the campaign he had astonished his aides-de-camp by his untiring energy, for sometimes he would even visit the outposts in person. On many occasions he had actually crept up to the most advanced post at great personal risk to himself, so anxious had he been to see with his own eyes. Such visits from the field marshal himself were not always welcome to the German outpost, 
who as soon as they showed the least sign of commotion consequent upon the visit were at once swept by a withering English fire. Yet he now stood there, the conqueror, and while many of his officers were installing themselves in comfortable quarters in houses about North End, North Hill, South Hill, Muswell Hill, Roslyn Hill, Fitzjohn's Avenue, Netherhall, and Maresfield Gardens, and other roads in that vicinity, the great commander was still alone upon the heath, having taken nothing save a nip from his flask since his coffee at dawn. Time after time telegraphic dispatches were handed to him from Germany, and telephonic reports from his various positions around London, but he received them all without comment. He read, he listened, but he said nothing. For a full hour he remained there, strolling up and down alone in quick impatience. Then, as though suddenly making up his mind, he called three members of his staff and gave orders for an entry into London. This, as he knew, was the signal for a terrible and bloody encounter. Bugles sounded. Men and officers, who had believed that the storm and stress of the day were over and that they were entitled to rest, found themselves called upon to fight their way into the city that they knew would be defended by an irate and antagonistic populace. Still the order had been given, and it must be obeyed. They had expected that the advance would be at least made at dawn, but evidently von Kronhelm feared that six hours' delay might necessitate more desperate fighting. He intended, now that London was cowed, that she should be entirely crushed. The orders of his master the Kaiser were to that effect. Therefore, shortly before nine o'clock, the first detachments of German infantry marched along Spaniards Road and down Roslyn Hill to Haverstock Hill, where they were at once fired upon from behind the debris of the great barricade across the junction of Prince of Wales Road and Haverstock Hill. This place was held strongly by British infantry, many members of the Legion of Frontiersmen, distinguished only by the little bronze badge in their buttonholes, and also by hundreds of citizens armed with rifles. Twenty Germans dropped at the first volley, and next instant a maxim, concealed in the first floor of a neighboring house, spat forth its fire upon the invaders with deadly effect. The German bugle sounded the advance rapidly, and the men emulously ran forward, shouting loud hurrahs. Major von Wittig, who had distinguished himself very conspicuously in the fighting round Enfield Chase, fell, being shot through the lung when just within a few yards of the half-ruined barricade. Londoners were fighting desperately, shouting and cheering. The standard-bearer of the 4th Battalion of the Brunswick Infantry Regiment, number 92, fell severely wounded, and the standard was instantly snatched from him in the awful hand-to-hand -hand fighting which that moment ensued. Five minutes later the streets were running with blood, for hundreds, both Germans and British, lay dead and dying. Every Londoner struggled valiantly until shot down, yet the enemy, always reinforced, pressed forward, until ten minutes later the defenders were driven out of their position, and the house for which the Maxim was sending forth its deadly hail had been entered and the gun captured. Volley after volley was still, however, poured out on the heads of the storming party, but already the prisoners were at work clearing away for the advance, and very soon the Germans had surmounted the obstruction and were within London. For a short time the Germans halted. Then, at a signal from their officers, they moved along both roads, again being fired upon from every house in the vicinity, many of the defenders having retired to continue their defense from the windows. The enemy, therefore, turned their attention to these houses, and after desperate struggles house after house was taken, those of the defenders not wearing uniform being shot down without mercy. To such no quarter was given. The contest now became a most furious one. Britons and Germans fought hand to hand. A battalion of the Brunswick Infantry, with some riflemen of the guard, took several houses by rush in Chalk Farm Road but in many cases the Germans were shot by their own comrades. Quite a number of the enemy's officers were picked off by the frontiersmen, those brave fellows who had seen service in every corner of the world, and who were now in the windows and upon roofs. 
thus the furious fight from house to house proceeded this exciting conflict was practically characteristic of what was at that moment happening in fifty other spots along the suburbs of north london the obstinate resistance which we made against the germans was met with equally obstinate aggression there was no surrender londoners fell and died fighting to the very last against those well-trained teutons in such overwhelming masses we however could have no hope of success the rushes of the infantry and rifles of the guards were made skilfully and slowly but surely broke down all opposition the barricade in the kentish town road was defended with valiant heroism the germans were as in chalk farm road compelled to fight their way foot by foot losing heavily all the time but here at length as at other points the barricade was taken and the defenders chased and either taken prisoner or else ruthlessly shot down a body of citizens armed with rifles were after the storming of the barricades in question driven back into park street and there being caught between two bodies of germans slaughtered to a man through those unlit side streets between kentish town and camden roads namely the lawford bartholomew rochester caversham and leighton roads there was much skirmishing and many on both sides fell in the bloody encounter a thousand deeds of bravery were done that night but were unrecorded before the barricade in holloway road which had been strongly repaired after the breach made in it by the german shells the enemy lost very heavily for the three maxims which had there been mounted did awful execution the invaders however seeing the strong defence fell back for full twenty minutes and then making another rush hurled petrol bombs into the midst of our men a frightful holocaust was the result fully a hundred of the poor fellows were literally burned alive while the neighbouring houses being set in flames compelled the citizen free-shooters to quickly evacuate their position against such terrible missiles even the best trained troops cannot stand therefore no wonder that all opposition at that point was soon afterwards swept away and the pioneers quickly opened the road for the victorious legions of the kaiser and so in that prosaic thoroughfare the holloway road brave men fought gallantly and died while the scotch piper paced the pavement sharply backwards and forwards with his colours flying then alas came the red flash the loud explosions in rapid succession and the next instant the whole street burst into a veritable sea of flame high street kingsland was also the scene of several fierce conflicts but here the germans decidedly got the worst of it the whole infuriated population seemed to emerge suddenly from the side streets of the kingsland road on the appearance of the detachment of the enemy and the latter were practically overwhelmed notwithstanding the desperate fight they made then ringing cheers went up from the defenders the germans were given no quarter by the populace all of whom were armed with knives or guns the women mostly with hatchets crowbars or edged tools many of the germans fled through the side streets toward mare street and were hotly pursued the majority of them being done to death by the maddened mob the streets in this vicinity were literally a slaughter-house the barricades in finchley road and in high road kilburn were also very strongly held and at the first named it was quite an hour before the enemy's pioneers were able to make a breach indeed then only after a most hotly contested conflict in which there were frightful losses on both sides petrol bombs were here also used by the enemy with appalling effect the road being afterwards cleared by a couple of maxims farther towards regent's park the houses were however full of sharpshooters and before these could be dislodged the enemy had again suffered severely the entry into london was both difficult and perilous and the enemy suffered great losses everywhere after the breaking down of the defences in high road kilburn the men who had held them retired to the town hall opposite kilburn station and from the windows fired at the passing battalions doing much execution all efforts to dislodge them proved unavailing until the place was taken by storm and a fearful hand-to-hand -hand fight was the outcome eventually the town hall was taken after a most desperate resistance 
and ten minutes later willfully set fire to and burned. In the Harrow Road and those cross streets between Kensal Green and Mita Vale the advancing Germans shared much the same fate as about Hackney. Surrounded by the armed populace, hundreds upon hundreds of them were killed, struck down by hatchets, stabbed by knives, or shot with revolvers, the crowd shouting, Down with the Germans! Kill them! Kill them! Many of the London women now became perfect furies. So incensed were they at the wreck of their homes and the death of their loved ones that they rushed wildly into the fray with no thought of peril, only a bitter revenge. A German, whenever caught, was at once killed. In those bloody street fights the Teutons got separated from their comrades and were quickly surrounded and done to death. Across the whole of the northern suburbs the scenes of bloodshed that night were full of horror as men fought in the ruined streets, climbing over the smoldering debris, over the bodies of their comrades, and shooting from behind ruined walls. As von Kronhelm had anticipated, his army was compelled to fight its way into London. The streets all along the line of the enemy's advance were now strewn with dead and dying. London was doomed. The Germans now coming on in increasing, nay, unceasing numbers, were leaving behind them everywhere the trail of blood. Shattered London stood staggered. Though the resistance had been long and desperate, the enemy had again triumphed by reason of his sheer weight of numbers. Yet even though he were actually in our own dear London, our people did not mean that he should establish himself without any further opposition. Therefore, though the barricades had been taken, the Germans found in every unexpected corner men who shot at them, and maxims which spat forth their leaden showers beneath which hundreds upon hundreds of Teutons fell. Yet they advanced, still fighting. The scenes of carnage were awful and indescribable, no quarter being given to any armed citizens not in uniform, be they men, women, or children. The German army was carrying out the famous proclamation of Field Marshal von Kronhelm to the letter they were marching on to the sack of the wealthiest city of the world. It wanted still an hour of midnight. London was a city of shadow, of fire, of death. The silent streets, whence all the inhabitants had fled in panic, echoed to the heavy tread of German infantry, the clank of arms, and the ominous rumble of guns. Ever and anon an order was shouted in German as the Kaiser's legions went forward to occupy the proud capital of the world. The enemy's plans appear to have been carefully prepared. The majority of the troops coming from the direction of Hampstead and Finchley entered Regent's Park, whence preparations were at once commenced for encampment, while the remainder, together with those who came down the Camden, Caledonian, and Holloway roads, turned along Euston Road and Oxford Street to Hyde Park, where a huge camp was formed stretching from the marble arch right along the park lane side away to Knightsbridge. Officers were very soon billeted in the best houses in Park Lane and about Mayfair, houses full of works of art and other valuables that had only that morning been left to the mercy of the invaders. From the windows and balconies of their quarters in Park Lane they could overlook the encampment, a position which had evidently been purposely chosen. Other troops who came in never-ending procession by the Bow Road, Roman Road, East India Dock Road, Victoria Park Road, Mare Street, and Kingsland Road all converged into the city itself, except those who had come from Edmonton down the Kingsland Road, and who, passing along Old Street and Clerkenwell, occupied the Charing Cross and Westminster districts. At midnight a dramatic scene was enacted when, in the blood-red glare of some blazing buildings in the vicinity, a large body of Prince Louis Ferdinand of Prussia's 2nd Magdeburg Regiment suddenly swept up Threadneedle Street into the great open space before the mansion house whereon the London flag was still flying aloft in the smoke-laden air. They halted across the junction of Cheapside with Queen Victoria Street when, at the same moment, another huge body of the Uhlans of Altamart and Magdeburg Hussars came clamoring along Corn Hill, followed a moment later by battalion after battalion of the 4th and 8th Thuringen Infantry out of Moorgate Street, whose uniform showed plain traces of the desperate encounters of the past week. 
the great body of Germans had halted before the mansion house when General von Kleppen, the commander of the Fourth Army Corps, who, it will be remembered, had landed at Weybourne, accompanied by Lieutenant General von Mirbach of the Eighth Division, and Furlich, commander of the cavalry brigade, ascended the steps of the mansion house and entered. Within, Sir Claude Harrison, the Lord Mayor, who wore his robes and jewel of office, received them in that great sombre room wherein so many momentous questions concerning the welfare of the British Empire had been discussed. The representative of the City of London, a short, stout, grey-haired man, was pale and agitated. He bowed, but he could not speak. Von Kleppen, however, a smart soldierly figure in his service uniform and many ribbons, bowed in response, and in very fair English said, "'I regret, my Lord Mayor, that it is necessary for us to thus disturb you, but, as you are aware, the British army has been defeated, and the German army has entered London. I have orders from Field Marshal von Kornhelm to place you under arrest.' and to hold you as hostage for the good behavior of the city during the progress of the negotiations for peace. Arrest? Yes, the Lord Mayor. You intend to arrest me? It will not be irksome, I assure you, smiled the German commander grimly. At least we shall make it as comfortable as possible. I shall place a guard here, and the only restriction I place upon you is that you shall neither go out nor hold any communication with anyone outside these walls. But my wife? If her ladyship is here, I would advise that she leave the place. It is better that, for the present, she should be out of London. The civic officials, who had all assembled for the dramatic ceremonial, looked at each other in blank amazement. The Lord Mayor was a prisoner. Sir Claude divested himself of his jewel of office and handed it to his servant to replace in safekeeping. Then he took off his robe, and having done so, advanced closer to the German officers, who, treating him with every courtesy, consulted with him, expressing regret at the terrible loss of life that had been occasioned by the gallant defense of the barricades. Von Kleppen gave the Lord Mayor a message from von Kronhelm, and urged him to issue a proclamation forbidding any further opposition on the part of the populace of London. With the three officers Sir Claude talked for a quarter of an hour, while into the mansion house there entered a strong guard of men of the second Magdeburg, who quickly established themselves in the most comfortable quarters. German double sentries stood at every exit and in every corridor, and when a few minutes later the flag was hauled down and the German imperial standard run up, wild shouts of triumph rang from every throat of the densely packed body of troops assembled outside. The joyous hurrahs reached the Lord Mayor, still in conversation with von Kleppen, von Mirbach, and Furlich, and in an instant he knew the truth. The Teutons were saluting their own standard. The civic flag had, either accidentally or purposely, been flung down into the roadway below, and was trampled in the dust. A hundred enthusiastic Germans, disregarding the shouts of their officers, fought for the flag and it was instantly torn to shreds and little pieces preserved as souvenirs. Shout after shout in German went up from the wildly excited troops of the Kaiser when the light wind caused their own flag to flutter out, and then, as with one voice, the whole body of troops united in singing the German national hymn. The scene was weird and most impressive. London had fallen. Around were the wrecked buildings, some were still smoldering, some emitting flame. Behind lay the Bank of England with untold wealth locked within. To the right the damaged façade of the Royal Exchange was illuminated by a flickering light, which also shone upon the piled arms of the enemy's troops, causing them to flash and gleam. In those silent, narrow city streets not an Englishman was to be seen. Everyone, save the Lord Mayor, and his official attendants had fled. The government offices in Whitehall were all in the hands of the enemy. In the Foreign Office, the India Office, the War Office, the Colonial Office, the Admiralty and other minor offices were German guards. Sentries stood at the shattered door of the famous Number 10 Downing Street, and all up Whitehall was lined with infantry. 
German officers were in charge of all our public offices, and all officials who had remained on duty were firmly requested to leave. Sentries were stationed to guard the archives of every department, and precautions were taken to guard against any further outbreaks of fire. Across at the Houses of Parliament, with their damaged towers, the whole great pile of buildings was surrounded by triumphant troops, while across at the fine old Abbey of Westminster was, alas, a different scene. The interior had been turned into a temporary hospital, and upon mattresses placed upon the floor were hundreds of poor maimed creatures, some groaning, some ghastly pale in the last moments of agony, some silent, their white lips moving in prayer. On one side in the dim light lay the men, some in uniform, others inoffensive citizens who had been struck by cruel shells or falling debris. On the other side lay the women, some mere girls, and even children. Flitting everywhere in the half-light were nurses, charitable ladies, and female helpers, with numbers of doctors all doing their best to alleviate the terrible sufferings of that crowded place, the walls of which showed plain traces of the severe bombardment. In places the roof was open to the angry sky, while many of the windows were gaunt and shattered. A clergyman's voice somewhere was repeating a prayer in a low, distinct voice, so that all could hear, yet above all were the sighs and groans of the sufferers, and as one walked through that prostrate assembly of victims, more than one was seen to have already gone to that land that lies beyond the human ken. The horrors of war were never more forcibly illustrated than in Westminster Abbey that night, for the grim hand of death was there, and men and women lying with their faces to the roof looked into eternity. Every hospital in London was full, therefore the overflow had been placed in the various churches. From the battlefields along the northern defences, Epping, Edmonton, Barnet, Enfield, and other places where the last desperate stand had been made, and from the barricades in the northern suburbs, ambulance wagons were continually arriving full of wounded, all of whom were placed in the churches and in any large public buildings which had remained undamaged by the bombardment. St. George's Hanover Square, once the scene of many smart weddings, was now packed with unfortunate wounded soldiers, British and German lying side by side, while in the Westminster Cathedral and the Oratory at Brompton the Roman Catholic priest made hundreds of poor fellows as comfortable as they could, many members of the religious sisterhoods acting as nurses. St. James's Church in Piccadilly, St. Pancras Church, Shoreditch Church, and St. Mary Abbott's Kensington were all improvised hospitals, and many grim and terrible scenes of agony were witnessed during that long eventful night. The light was dim everywhere, for there were only paraffin lamps, and by their feeble illumination many a difficult operation had to be performed by those London surgeons who one and all had come forward and were now working unceasingly. Renowned specialists from Harley Street, Cavendish Square, Queen Anne Street, and the vicinity were directing the work in all the improvised hospitals, men whose names were world-famous kneeling and performing operations upon poor unfortunate private soldiers or upon some laborer who had taken up a gun in defense of his home. Of lady helpers there were hundreds, from Mayfair and Belgravia, from Kensington and Bayswater, ladies had come forward offering their services, and their devotion to the wounded was everywhere apparent. In St. Andrews, Wells Street, St. Peter's, Eaton Square, in the Scottish Church in Crown Court, Covent Garden, in the Temple Church, in the Union Chapel in Upper Street, in the Chapel Royal, Savoy, in St. Clement Danes in the Strand, and in St. Martin's in the Fields, there were wounded in greater or less numbers, but the difficulty of treating them were enormous owing to the lack of necessaries for the performance of operations. Weird and striking were the scenes within those hallowed places, as in the half-darkness with the long deep shadows men struggled for life or gave to the women kneeling at their side their name, their address, or a last dying message to the one they loved. London that night was a city of shattered homes of shattered hopes, of shattered lives. The silence of death had fallen everywhere, 
the only sounds that broke the quiet within those churches were the sighs, groans, and faint murmurings of the dying. End of chapter 6 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com